I call to order the June 28, 2021 business meeting of the Cincinnati Board of Education. We welcome everyone and please and request that everyone in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Please stand for the pledge. Mr. Lindy. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Please call roll. Mrs. Bates? Present. Mrs. Bolton? Present. Mrs. Bowers? Here. Mr. Lindy? Here. Mr. Messer? Present. Mr. Roski? Here. President Jones? Here. Okay, so I need a motion for a 48-hour waiver to amend the agenda to add a resolution, which we'll present when we get to resolutions, it'll be the first resolution on the um, superintendent contract. Um, and in addition to that, to modify the agenda and move the board matters subject before the hearing of the public. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Mrs. Bates? Aye. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Members of the public who wish to speak may do so by clicking the chat button. Now the chat feature will be open for your request for five minutes. Please submit your name, your affiliation to the district, your school community, your topic, and your contact information if you want a direct response to any questions you might have. Okay, I need a motion to approve the minutes from the special meeting June 3rd, 2021, special meeting June 7th, 2021, business meeting June 7th, 2021, special meeting June 16th, 2021, and the special meeting June 23rd, 2021. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved as presented. Okay, Ms. Bowers, you have five minutes for your student achievement report. Thank you, um, President Jones. I have before me the minutes from the um, Student Achievement and District Instructional Performance Committee meeting that was held on June 4th. Um, we were um, graced by the presence of uh, Mr. Strawbert, um, who presented along with uh, Ms. Ryan Mooney Bullock uh, from Green Umbrella. Uh, we talked, we, we got an update um, about some of the global aim and, and key drivers regarding the outdoor education. Um, some of the SMART goals are, are listed in our in the minutes in writing. Um, some of the key points uh, for the fiscal year 2022 was um, that he updated the committee on was that the focus of every building to have an outdoor education learning environment um, and inclusive of the professional development for teachers to build capacity for that. Mr. Trumpert also um, talked about, um, presented about green schoolyards, technical assistance cohort, and how cities were connecting with children to nature. Um, was suggested that we create a resolution, which I have um, presented to our um, general counsel about how to do that regarding expanding um, outdoor learning across our district. Mr. Trumpert also uh, talked about professional development, um, with inclusive of curriculum and integration. And some of the next steps to this would be prioritizing um, schools for green-based data, op open access uh, policies for the district, uh, meaning allowing the space to be used for community members, and, which aligns with community learning centers, um, and working with groups to define goals for the 2021 uh, school year and plan of action. Um, there was conversation around, um, let me see, we talked about integrating uh, with persistent and being persistent with curriculums across all schools. Um, I also mentioned uh, comments regarding the agribusiness, how it relates to uh, engaging with the outdoor learning and how we can we can um, excel on that. Ms. Campbell talked about accelerated learning. She graces with her presence. Uh, she talked uh, focused on high dosage tutoring and, and, and the benefits of that. 
And we also had an intensive conversation about the benefits of utilizing um, our tutors and how it would be best to do in-house tutors that are better connected with students. We talked a little bit about how to get parents involved with getting reports on that. Mr. Lindy was pretty focused on that uh, during this meeting. And we also talked, she also talked about summer scholars and preschool enrollment and parents who are, you know, desire to be in the preschool programming and how they were able to uh, accommodate some of those families. Uh, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dean Blaze, Director of School Leadership, was also present, updated us on the IB program, um, talked about the diploma program, which is equivalent to um, the AP program, and how they're branching out. Uh, they have twin pathways for students at Dater High School. The other pathway will be career-related programming. Um, and we also were able to be graced with the presence of Mr. Cole Champ, who talks about the rolling back of, of the a, uh, IB program at um, Roberts Academy. Talked a little bit about the budget cost uh, for some of the trainings around these things. And we did have a <laughs> Miss Daniel Reed Felix was present, but we didn't get to talk to her. She actually, she actually presented us with data on College Credit Plus that we had requested in the previous meeting. Um, Ms. Bolton wanted to also note to the administration to address, and this might be in the new, new uh, shore kind of whole um, conversation that I'm hoping to hear from um, in the near future around administration addressing how to use uh, Cincinnati Digital Academy more in a broad aspect. These are the minutes from the uh, Student Achievement uh, Committee, and I present these minutes as written. Thank you. Do board members have questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Lindy. Uh, thanks, President Jones. I think the, the summary that uh, Member Bowers gave was, was great. I just wanted to raise one uh, discussion item we had. I think one of the, um, I think very strong points of the interim superintendent's plan for uh, COVID learning recovery. You know, what do we do in the face of this just unprecedented challenge that we're having? Uh, has to do with these uh, every two week on grade level assessments and reading and math, which I think is a really, really, really great idea. And I'm very excited about it. I think there's a question about how often does the student achievement committee or the board look at what those numbers are saying? Um, and I think there are lots of lots of possible answers to that question, but just that that was one. Um, one, I think, uh, open discussion point for us to figure out as we go into the next school year. I'm not suggesting we solve it tonight, uh, just that I think that's an important question and want to say, uh, again, thank you to the administration. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about the student achievement report? Okay, thank you. Mr. Messer, do you, Mr. Messer, do you have access to your committee of the whole meeting minutes? You're muted. We can't hear you. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, um, can can I ask a, board, a fellow board member if they want to introduce the minutes? Anybody here have your minutes in front of you from Committee of the Whole? Go ahead, Ms. Bolton. Yes. Uh, again, uh, I think all of us are pleased about reinstitu reinstituting uh, the Committee of the Whole. We had a, a very wonderful report about our summer scholars, uh, and I know there's an update at our tables as well, answering one of the two questions or so that were raised. Talked in terms of positive uh, culture and safety, talked in terms of curriculum, uh, and uh, what we're doing regarding outcomes and the continuing planning. There was also uh, some really nice stuff uh, from a budget standpoint and investment and return on investment in, a, uh, in the um, efforts uh, talking in terms of strategic impact of the spending that is at least initially designed and proposed. And that was presented to us with numbers and with uh, targets and benchmarks that we know Mr. Uh, Lindy likes. And that uh, budget update continued and it led to some discussion about just when we might actually be ready to pass a full budget, considering that some of the budget this year um, really impacts more, even more greatly than normal uh, due to the additional federal funds and state funds that are there uh, would impact uh, for the next couple of years. And the famous cliff that our treasurer has introduced us to uh, that needing to be planned, and so that was discussed, and that led then to an assignment uh, to the finance to, uh, committee to talk a little bit more about what that schedule for the passage of the budget might entail. And indeed, in finance, we've had that. 
Thank you, Ms. Fulton. Do board members have questions or comments about the report? Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Bolton, you have budget finance and growth. Right. Uh, we started, again, a great meeting, I think. Uh, really appreciate the administration's efforts. Uh, the treasurer presented her goals uh, for the coming year regarding evaluation and her uh, uh, participation and, and guidance is welcome to the finance committee. We did suggest to add a fifth, and since then she has done that. We had rather extensive reports from the preschool Promise folks, as well as an extensive report uh, talking in terms of Cincinnati CPS preschool uh, enrollment and expansion, including a presentation on uh, Get a Jump Start, uh, which is a uh, August uh, a summer uh, effort. And we had saw, I think for maybe the second time, the Preschool Promise dashboard. And we know that Mr. Messer was pleased to see that because he was one of the people early on suggested it should be there. We found out that they will, the preschool promise folks will continue uh, with their evaluation by uh, innovations and that the, the preschool promise manager board, board of managers is going to be having a retreat uh, to kind of outline the next steps. But the biggest news was uh, sh uh, shared with, by their director. Uh, and it was somewhat alarming, and I think most of us now know what Mrs. De Ms. Jackson was saying, and that is that both from the political left and the political right, uh, the step up to quality plan uh, is somewhat under attack, and there's some threat that somehow it will be diminished or ended, and, um, and so we need to be working together with those partners, and we know that uh, Mrs. Bates and, and uh, had con contacted folks that we need to, uh, Kearney and Mr. Glover, uh, and so hopefully we can help uh, not have that happen. From the right, it's always the uh, worry about preschool uh, anyway as to whether or not there should be public supported preschool. From the left, to the worry that somehow the step up to quality is making it too hard for many of the entrepreneurs that have their own businesses uh, to do what they need to do. But for me, this is a city that is uh, Cincinnati has found a way to deal with those issues. And we're so proud of our preschool promise plan. But if indeed some of the things that the state legislature is planning uh, would end our program, as simple as that. And it would so decimate some parts of it that we need to be able to deal with it. Had another extensive report uh, from the CPS outside folks, uh, as was mentioned to its student achievement. And then we know that they've appeared here at least twice for the full board. There is a significant amount of money that is earmarked right now in our, our upcoming budget. And their interest uh, was uh, to find out from our treasurer the kinds of things that are allowable and would be appropriate from a standpoint of CARES and uh, um, uh, rescue or whatever we're calling all of those things. And we did talk about social emotional. We did talk about facilities. We know there is some money devoted to facilities uh, regarding making our campuses and our buildings be able to uh, offer outside classrooms and out outdoor learning. Uh, then we had the uh, our wonderful uh, internal uh, director of internal audit report, and uh, she outlined some of the major things they'll be doing uh, coming up, and that is uh, kind of looking at the uh, district strategic plan and also following the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. Those are those federal funds that are coming in. Had an extensive report from Ms. Trimble Oliver and Mr. Johnson on transportation. I will not go through all of it. Uh, and there is also at the back of these minutes a rather extensive memo from Mr. Johnson. The only thing I would point to is that the, they have uh, are in the process of extending the contracts for, for one year with our current vendors. Some vendors have consolidated, so things have changed. One of our biggest vendors was bought out, uh, and they seem to be making some progress. Some of the money for transportation uh, has at least been able to be absorbed uh, by some of these additional funds. The, the issue for us there in, in the memo from Mr. Johnson particularly might be somewhat, it looks really like we're getting a handle on all of this, this biggest operation we have. 
However, there is some reference regarding uh, use of Metro, and I, I'm sure the public will be aware of it. The use of Metro may be starting at the, um, when the yellow bus is just not possible, if there's a possibility, some limited possibility of fourth and fifth and sixth graders having to use Metro, and I'm assuming that we will be thinking hard about that. So, but the report was great, and we appreciate all their work that they've done. And their action uh, item is that they will, we've asked uh, that they report to the board, full board, on August 9th, prior to the beginning of school, so that the whole board has an understanding of what is about to happen regarding transportation. And uh, that's, we had a discussion, as the board asked, about the uh, a timeline and the that discussion took place and the treasurer has ar uh, arrived at a, a, a different timeline and we're seeing some of the resolutions as a result of that conversation. Okay, thank you. Do board members have questions about the report? Mr. Morawski. Just an uh, update. So the good news Please. is so the conference committee met today and the state budget um, to, is gonna get passed on um, to the governor and the. Uh, the Senate Republicans who messed with the seventh quality language, that language got undone. And so while it's it's not as great as it was, um, it's kind of reverted back to just the regular language that was there. So the step up to quality is not out of the budget. And I, the governor is certainly going to leave it in because he's an early childhood ed, uh, fanatic. To quote one of my friends who's uh, really involved in the early childhood uh, game. Uh, she says that um, it's more like a video game where we have no more superpowers and are on our last life. We aren't dead yet, but we are being chased. Uh, so <laughs> it's an amazing, uh, and she, I got a cute gif of Mario too. Um, anyway, um, but so that's good news. And the other good news was that all of the money for preschool that was being proposed to be taken out of the budget is in. So preschool isn't being hurt and step up to quality is kind of status quo, but there's still people gunning for it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Ms. Bowers. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Board Member Morawski, for that. But in, uh, I want to add to that that in um, health and safety today, Senator Kearney explained that um, we have a lot of support in our momentum with our viewpoint. So all of our urban, all of the urban eight schools are in the same focus, but we have 20 plus schools that are still advocating for our position too. So we got good momentum going. So we're being hopeful. Thank you. Good update. Wonderful. Okay, so we're moving on to presentations. Superintendent Ahmad, please introduce the first presentation. Yes? You didn't do the uh, voice vote uh, on a minute. Oh. <laughs> How'd I miss that? Okay. Um, we need a motion to approve the committee mem minutes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Treasurer. Just all, in, all favor. in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Ms. Amat. Yes, it is a great pleasure to introduce the team who will be presenting on the full student learning models. Um, we have Chief Information Officer Jeremy Galliou, Director of Curriculum, Emily Campbell, Director of Student Service, Margaret Hall. I also want to recognize Director of School Leadership, Monisha House, who's available during the question and answer session. And then our wonderful principal, Eric Rozier, who is the Hawkins Award and Rotary Award winner, Principal of the Year. So he will be joining us today. So right. congratulations. Thank you, Interim Superintendent Amont, board members, President Jones. Over the significant last period of time, we've had a number of individual conversations around our fall student learning models. Tonight, what we wanted to bring you is a consolidated update across all of those models to provide you a little deeper look into some of the insights, including the focus and some of the features of our wonderful in-person model, of course, some of these steps that have been taken to strengthen the digital academy, as well as some new data that we've recently come into regarding our concurrent program 
along with the students who are interested in it. So first up for our in-person model, Director Emily Campbell. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I am here to talk about our five-day in-person uh, learning model for the upcoming year. We're very excited to um, bring through um, three calls to action aligned to our research. Uh, the first call to action is to continue to find new affirming ways students see themselves and other cultures in their learning. Call to action two asks that we spend the vast amount of instructional time mastering on grade level work. And three, address unfinished learning with precision, just in time, opposed to just in case. So why do we have call to action one? Um, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop reminds us that when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. Why do we have calls to action two and three? This graphic on this slide um, is a great visual of um, the reasoning behind that. What we don't want to do is remediate unfinished learning for the first several months of the year because then we end up perpetuating more unfinished learning opposed to accelerating that learning. We're not alone. Um, the entire nation is looking for ways to recover um, after this pandemic. What we are is ahead. Um, we have one of the number one things that are outlined in all the research is to have high quality materials um, in your tier one instruction. And so this is just a reminder of those adopted high quality curriculums. Um, we did social studies and fine arts in 2018-19 was the first year of implementation. ELA, PE, and health was in the year 2019-2020. Mathematics was last year, and we are excited to um, host our adoption committees for science and world languages in this upcoming year. So because we are ahead, we have been able to enhance. In this upcoming year, in every social studies unit, K through 12, we will have lessons that address perspectives, equity, representation, and anti-racism. We will also be offering African American history in person at every high school. And we will also be um, addressing social emotional learning, social justice, um, with additional text in our K-12 ELA curriculum. This um, last one was in collaboration with Positive School Culture. And this book is an example of a text that is going to be added to our module one first grade unit where they explore how books change lives around the world. One thing that we learned this year that we will carry forward in our five day learning in person work is the use of Schoology to make sure that all of our curriculum is organized and accessible um, to our students and family as that launching pad. And finally, bringing it all together, um, what we'll see is uh, accelerated learning in two-week cycles. So we'll launch it out of Schoology. Students will have access to our high-quality materials. We will un address unfinished learning so that students can access what that current cycle of instruction is. And then we will provide what um, we're referencing as temperature checks so that teachers can monitor progress and celebrate success. Good evening. Good evening. So we're going to talk about Cincinnati Digital Academy and the option for that in the fall. Um, the first thing we'd like to talk about is our mission statement. Um, Cincinnati Digital Academy provides traditional and non-traditional students um, an alternative for learning. Um, this is a curriculum-based 
a technology curriculum, uh, technology based curriculum that we prepare students with opportunity to become self motivated, lifelong learners in order to become successful, active, and productive citizens in society. So a lot of us want to say, who, who are we? We talk about CDA. Who are we? Um, we're an online technology uh, based learning option that is provided through Edgenuity. Um, learning outcomes are reinforced through student led and teacher led Google Meets. Uh, where our instructional platform allows for the flexibility of working schedule that promotes, a com promotes access that accommodates the students' needs. Um, that's one, one of the big things that our parents have, have, have uh, let us know that the flexibility really helps them. That's one of our greatest selling points, which is the flexibility. And, and it also allows our students to access teachers um, even after school hours. So that, that's a big thing that our that parents uh, let us know. Next slide. Um, our CDA K-6, to what we also learn is our students um, like the teacher-student interaction. So we've actually increased our Google Meets, uh, math and English um, daily. Um, those Google Meets will also be recorded and posted on Clever, Clever pages so that those students that actually miss it are able to go back and uh, access those Google Meets. We also provide one-to-one -one small group Meets um, to accelerate learning and meet student needs. Um, some of the instructional interventions that we have also used resources available are Epic, Learning A to Z, Orton Gillingham, Foundations, Prodigy, and iReady. Again, our parents are our biggest, you know, we, we access, we survey our parents a lot to kind of continue to uh, refine our program and see what they want. Next slide. Our seven to 12, um, we have increased our emphasis on Google Meets to support individual struggling students as an intervention. Um, we've added additional electives in middle school and high school. Um, with some emphasis on civics, health, and additional foreign languages in middle school. And we've also added 22 additional high school elective and math courses, including African American history and classes focusing on business, careers, and technology. Um, communication, like I said, was a big thing for us. So we try to make sure that we communicate with our families and stakeholders in numerous ways so that, you know, there's no uh, gap in between. Um, the first one, we were trying to provide each uh, family with a parent portal so that the uh, parent can actually monitor their child's progress um, and they know exactly where they are at at all times. Um, there, there's no misunderstanding there. Um, weekly ingenuity reports um, go out to parents weekly so that parents, again, know exactly, you know, where, where their child is at and what they may need. And we also use our POSSIP survey. Um, our positive survey gives us good information and good data to uh, continue to refine our our um, uh, program. Um, and I'll hand it back over to uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Eric. So for our concurrent model, we recently completed our first post school from the main school year uh, commitment and optioning survey for lack of a better term of parents and families specifically the 2600 students that we ended the school year with that were registered as online only at their home school so let me repeat that one last time because i know that the, the number is there is kind of confusing the, the population for this first or for this uh, optioning form was the 2,600 students who ended the year in a full remote model at their home school. Of those 2,600 students and families, we received a 27% response rate, which is was pretty amazing for a post school year uh, effort. Uh, with that, you know, it gives us a very high validity and a very low margin of error. So we were very happy with uh, the results or the response rate. From that, however, we saw that approximately 1% of those responding students plan to switch their enrollment from remote at their home school to CDA for next year. So again, that would be students above and beyond the projections for Digital Academy. 
approximately 3% were undecided between the three options. A large 84, almost 84% were committed with an intention to return to in-person learning next year, with the remaining 11% committing to enroll for a concurrent program if it was off. With this data, we can extrapolate that against our student body and give a fairly confident estimate that what we're looking at for next school year for our concurrent program, if we offer it, would be approximately 300 students. If all of the undecided were to decide they wanted to go into a concurrent model, we would be just shy of 400 as the max that we would be expecting for next school year. So with this data in mind, we looked at it from the impact of what our planning and those, those um, equipment needs that we've talked about prior, in, in summary, the number of classrooms we would need, right? So if you look at these three schools, we picked as examples. The first school, Rockdale, represents kind of the best case scenario. A lot of the students are very highly densely packed. So you can see in like second grade, there are five students who want concurrent. What this enables us to do is take those five students and roll them into a single classroom and create a concurrent classroom for them. In the middle, we have Rose Lawn, which is kind of mixed. And then on the end, we have SCPA, which represents the most challenging scenario. At SCPA, the responses so far included essentially one student per grade level. So this means that we would almost have to dedicate one classroom per student to be able to offer the concurrent method model for them. With those numbers, looking at just the baseline, you're looking at the overlap plus those singular, uh, the one-off students, would indicate that 63% of the concurrent respondent students would require a unique set of classrooms just for their use. Now, that gives us the number to the left where we have an estimated number of classrooms around 300. Again, that's the baseline. However, we went back and started taking a deeper look at those schools where the grades transition between classrooms and high schools, where a student may need three, four, even five classrooms throughout the day. So as opposed to even a one-to-one -one model, you're looking at potentially four to five classrooms per student that was interested, that would be committing to the concurrent model, which pushes us up closer to 630 plus range number of classrooms to service those 300 plus kids. And you can see, just as a quick update for the pricing that we've talked about in the past update here. So that gets us down to a lot more information than we've had previously in terms of real numbers of data, uh, um, in terms of the number of classrooms we would need. So now let's take a look at what those classrooms would look like, because we want to be very explicit in their design. So first and foremost, these classrooms would have a fixed camera, essentially one camera that only shows the air and, I'm sorry, a microphone, that would be focused on showing the primary teaching location of the classroom. So essentially the front of the classroom, the whiteboard, the projector, that area of the classroom. The second part would be teachers would still utilize Google Meet as the platform for the concurrent students. So on a daily basis, teachers would need to start their Google Meet class, send that information to the student or students, and then make sure that they end that class for each of their class sessions. So this would enable the, the remote students to be able to view and hear the classroom and what's going on. It would permit limited engagement between the remote student and the teacher through essentially the teacher's laptop. Without the integration piece, they would, they would be very limited options for engagement student to student or beyond the teacher directly through the laptop. So in addition to the remote classroom configuration, the last thing we've discussed previously was the custom engagement space that each school would be getting. This space uh, is, is, like I said, would be custom for every school. ITM will work with the schools to find the appropriate space, whether that's a CLC, a library, potentially a media room, or even potentially a classroom. But this space is really designed around that entire interactive engagement platform with an interactive display board, a 360 degree pan tilt zoom camera with tracking, multi, uh, multiple cameras throughout the room that allow, allow it to track all of the, the movement and presentations, a room-wide microphone sound, but this room is not just geared for an engagement with students on a limited basis, but it would be for the building to be able to use to engage with parents, community members, corporate and community partners, and students as needed. 
So in addition to the three models we've talked about, we've also invited Dr. Hall to come up <laughs> and give us some insight into the additional supports that will be available for our diverse learners. Good evening. Good evening. So student services provides a continuum of supports for face-to-face -face instruction um, for our diverse learners so that we're able to meet all of their needs. The majority of our learners do receive this support in the general education setting. The infrastructure that we have in place to support our diverse learners for both instruction, in-person instruction um, and also for instruction at CDA five days a week. So various supports that we have in place range from assistive technology needs for our students, which could be in the form of communication needs, on-site behavioral supports for school teams, students, tools and resources for educational access, research-based interventions along with materials, assignments and information on Schoology. In addition, our intervention specialists, our English uh, language teachers and related service providers are located not only to provide supports in the building, but also at CDA. And we plan to hold Saturday school um, next year for our English students. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn it back over to Interim Superintendent Amon for closing. Yes, thank you. Next slide, please. With gathering information from our parents on the optioning form, so very specific, and getting feedback from people in the field, we have some recommendations. The first is to encourage all students to return to five days. Um, and this is our rationale. We know this is the best way for students to learn, receive the needed social emotional support in the classrooms from teachers and staff. We also know that 70% of our staff has been vaccinated, which is higher than the state and local averages. And we continue with student vaccinations that will be available on our school sites. We will continue with strong safety protocols and very low transmission in school, as we demonstrated in the spring. And we also learned a lot through summer scholars as well. Next slide, please. As far as the distance learning option, with the enhanced CDA instruction, um, including more electives, support, Google Meets, we think that is our best option for distance learning. We also wanted to hear from the field. Uh, throughout the spring, we held um, sessions with teachers who piloted the concurrent learning at Walnut, and then we had a remote learning committee. And teachers and principals rated concurrent learning nine to one as the least effective. As Jeremy shared, very little interaction. It's almost just observing in the classroom. And then lastly, the cost, um, up to $900,000 for about 300 students. Um, and again, it's not only the 300 students, it's roughly about over 600 classrooms would be affected based on um, how the, the schedule is set up. We thought we wanted to be transparent. We learned early on that we were kind of building the plane as we were flying it um, during the pandemic and going from different learning models. We want to make sure we are completely transparent with our public. We wanted to make sure that we engaged our teachers and staff and had their voices heard in this recommendation. So we wanted to share that with you. So we have things in place, but our two recommendations are in-person learning and CDA as the option for distance learning. So that concludes our presentation and our team is here to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, board members, questions or comments? Wow, okay, well, Ms. Bowers, we'll start with you. Yes, thank you everybody for the presentation and the, and the detailed information. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, I want to comment. Thank you for the Saturday School. I love that for 
for English learners. That, that's that's uh, massive for um, population of families. Um, and then I concur with the parents, like in the flexible schedule at CDA for our high schoolers. The question that I do have is uh, regarding the additional courses. I know this year there was, uh, with the intensity of us needing to have more uh, advanced um, placement courses at CDA, do we still offer AP courses? Are we increasing that? Are we moving away from that at CDA for this upcoming year? We um, were customized and we will continue to be customized. So what we did was those students who signed up, every child that needed an AP course received that AP course. Um, a lot of times that happened with the actual teacher um, at the school site. Okay. Because some of it was specialty, like a dance class. Right. And, and with that in the same vein, um, do we know how many students are leaving CD to go back to their home school or they're going to stay based on what happened during COVID? Do we have a higher number staying this year than, and when, than we started? I'm trying to get, I'm mm -hmm. trying to gauge their experience. Yeah. So we, what we have done is we have actually called all of our students, physically call every student. Um, right now, I, I would project that we will be anywhere from six to hundred to a thousand students next year. A lot of parents have decided that they want to stay. Um, but we do have some of those unknowns. Um, we just don't really have a, a ball, a really exact number until uh, all the kids make a determination. Thank you. And my last comment, uh, President Jones, um, with the recommendations uh, from you uh, and from Superintendent Amai, with the, Can regarding, you talk into the, regarding the concurrent learning, mm -hmm. uh, I saw that Jeremy, in your presentation, was presented about a space for a community uh, concurrent learning. Is that, I didn't know if that was in, included in the recommendation um, for this school year. I know we talked about the classroom was not part of the recommendation, but is the community space for concurrent. I don't want to speak for the superintendent, but I believe the engagement space would be considered separate. Okay. It, it's it's almost in addition to the classroom, so it would be separate from that recommendation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lindy. Uh, thanks, President Jones. I want to just echo, uh, I think, my, my colleague in saying how great the presentation was and how, how thankful I am for it. I think just specifically, uh, I, I love the fact that you all were making some very clear recommendations on what you thought the right thing to do next was. That's uh, very much appreciated by me. Uh, and I also think that the content of the recommendations themselves were great. Uh, and, and so you certainly have you know one supportive board member for both of those and me. Um, I also just appreciated the um, examples and the description of high quality curriculum. Um, where kids can both see their own backgrounds reflected and also learn about others. I thought that was wonderful. Um, and Jeremy, I thought some of the data and analysis was just really clear and very helpful. So, so thanks uh, all around. Uh, I think the only question I had was around the dollars. Um, if, if we do go in this direction, does that save us some in the budget? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, if we do go in the direction you're recommending, does it save us some money in the budget? It, it does. So the, the budget for the classroom classrooms it was set as, for the classroom technology was set into the CARES fund. So it would save us some CARES funds in terms to the tune of that 450 to 900,000 if we were to not be doing those classrooms. Anything else? Okay, Mr. Morosky. Thank you, President Jones. Um, I'll just start by offering an opinion as somebody who had you know been beating the concurrent drum for a while i mean i made this note in public already a couple times but i i think i've certainly kind of changed my mind in a lot of ways um regarding the concurrent um for a number of reasons one safety wise of course but then also to the uh, interim's superintendent's point it's better for the kids to be in school and if we have the precautions they can take and the kids can be safe then i think that's where they need to be um, so I just wanted to offer that opinion, um, particularly, again, as being somebody who was sort of, thank you, Jeremy, for working so hard for so long uh, to try to make everybody uh, happy, which is impossible, but it, it was noted. And I just want to, I want to say thank you for that. Um, and that leads me into uh, a question. I only have a couple questions. Um, 
But the one is, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but this does dovetail what I just said dovetails into the CDA, which has done yeoman's work. Um, and I just can't give enough kudos to CDA and what's gone on there. So thank you. Talk about not having any notice uh, to take on uh, everybody's, uh, the whole world's issue. So thank you to CDA for that. I think that does deserve something. Um, it's amazing. And so, um, and I don't, and I'm not trying, I'm, I'm really honestly not put it, trying to put um, any, anyone on the spot here or beat a dead horse because this has come up before. I was just hoping somebody could offer an assurance as we've seen the national news stories. And I'm certain, I know I've been contacted dozens of times, and I don't know if everyone else has, but about the somewhat maybe troubling content of ingenuity that does not align with what Ms. Campbell was showing us about what we're going to be doing in the fall, um, to say nothing of uh, sort of First Amendment issues of pushing uh, religious agendas. Again, obviously, talk about religion, history. You can't have social studies without talking about religion and comparative religion. That's different than what I know ingenuity has been found guilty of, which is pushing a certain agenda, uh, not to mention only mentioning Native Americans once in their American history lesson. So I know this has come up before. But I know people are watching and um, and expect better of us. So can somebody provide just maybe some assurance we've audited this curriculum? Um, we have worked very closely with uh, Principal Rozier and his uh, teaching staff to look carefully at those lessons. Um, you might remember in his presentation that we have um, supplemented, especially in the elementary and middle school, which is what um, was referenced in some of that work with ready math, with foundations, with wit and wisdom, mm -hmm. so that students are ha having access to high quality um, materials. Okay, I, th I, I think that's great. I just, however, I mean, I don't know how it gets done, but I, it, it is troubling and it does, the ingenuity is in the national news quite frequently regarding these. We are a leader. I mean, the, the interim superintendent begins her 30 day, 90 day plan with equity and anti-racism. And I know it's a priority for you, um, Superintendent Amat, and it is for you, Ms. Campbell. I just think we need to be real careful about the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way to let people know what we're doing, um, I wanna, and I might keep bringing it up, so I'll apologize now. So thank you. Yep. Um, my last question was, um, and it is to the interim superintendent, you had said, I heard, I think I heard the number 70% of teachers were vaccinated or something? Staff. All staff. of staff, not just teachers. So we All do staff. have that number now? Yes. Okay. Important. Yep. Yeah. Well, that, okay, I think I just think that's significant. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Messer and then Ms. Bolton. I think my microphone's working. Is it working? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, I won't add anything. Um, you know, my colleagues had some uh, great things there. I won't restate is what I'm trying to say here. But a um, couple of things uh, as it relates to the curriculum. I love this kind of enhancement period, even though we kind of went through some of that. We're doing these enhancements. Um, and will we be thinking about diversity as a whole? And of course, the African American history I think is so crucial. Um, as Ms. Morosky talked about, um, I too share some of those same concerns, uh, just based on what at least I think I know. Um, and you know, will there be elements of LGBTQ plus history uh, that's part of you know what's got us to where we are today? It is Pride Month. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about that. Um, is it something that could be addressed? Here. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We um, look through this work through the lens with our curriculum council. So that subject has come up of how we can be more inclusive. We received information. There was a study done over at Fairview, um, and we're looking at supplemental uh, materials. So yes, we are in discussion of having a more inclusive 
curriculum. Very good. Um, and then, you know, I, I just wanted to, you know, as, as the recommendation came forward, um, give you my vote of support uh, to that recommendation in that, um, you know, of the 2,600, what is it, about 300 uh, said they'd like to have the concurrent learning. And my guess is if there was no pandemic and you did a random survey and you said, would you like this? I think you'd probably have that many people that would say, sure, I'd rather have my kids stay home for a variety of reasons. Um, unfortunately, this is a district of 36,000 kids. So um, I think those dollars could definitely be deployed in another direction. So I fully support that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bolton? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the report. Appreciate it. Um, I have several questions uh, just as a follow-up. Let me start with the uh, space for engagement. Uh, I'm unclear. I, I thought we kind of left the committee the whole meeting uh, regarding concurrent uh, efforts that every school would have at least that one space. Are you saying that is no longer in the plan or the budget or it's separate and it's not under instruction? No, we can, so, again, I didn't want to speak for the superintendent, but uh, our intention was that those engagement spaces would be separate from the recommendation around concurrent. That I really was included almost as an aside in the presentation and I apologize if that wasn't clear, that in addition to the concurrent rooms, if we were to do that, each school would regardless still have that engagement space. Okay, so let me be, let me be clear. We are going to have the concurrent space for engagement or special efforts by each school to reach out to the public. Correct. Yes. Okay, and that is in the dollar amount that we're talking about, but is it not under concurrent? It's under something else? Correct. What's it under? It was under the concurrent heading in total for the original 13 million that we looked right. at as a whole. It's not within that 450 to 900,000 that you saw tonight. But it is in the budget. It is in the budget. Space. Okay, thanks. All right, and um, the curriculum piece too. What are we doing about cleansing some of those lessons that are of concern to us? I don't know that we really got an answer there. Are we not teaching them? Are we avoiding them? Uh, we have taken them out. Excellent. That's a good answer. <laughs> that, now that's the kind of answer I like. <laughs> I, I liked your I liked your term cleansing. <laughs> Thanks. Make the make the uh, appropriate. Let me ask uh, this last: What is the AP program out of CDA? I know we had some confusion several months ago about what it was and what it wasn't. So Edgenuity offers AP classes. However, because of the quality of instruction that our own AP instructors give, we um, we work very closely with Principal Rozier and his counselor team. And whenever a child is ready to enroll in an AP class, we find a teacher who that child can enroll in um, in a model of learning with that teacher, opposed to the Edgenuity. So is that part of our blended learning? Yes. AP program that exists? Yeah, so, we've just expanded it a little bit because sometimes they need AP physics or, or AP dance like Superintendent Mont. Okay, thanks. And, and then my, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. And, I, and this is some months ago, I think Ms. Bates and I had a conversation. That's always dangerous, so be aware. But looking at CDA, it would be great if CDA also had kind of multiple wings and rooms to it, so to speak, virtually, and could assume more responsibility of some of the electronic and virtual things that the school sites are now delivering. I mean, to think a little broader about it rather than serving that population that wants to be at CDA. And 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 I second what Mr. Morosky said. That was a saving grace for that staff to kick in and for so many people to transfer there and be assigned there. But it, I think we have to think even bigger about having an almost virtual second CPS at CDA because that would also reduce some of the class size issues. It might reduce some, even if it's credit recovery or credit enhancement or advancement, 
or whenever it's it's kind of virtual, uh, it, just using the school site, uh, reducing some of the pressure on the school site, and and having some of that go to the people that really know how to do this, because we are very dependent upon virtual and uh, and and remote learning and electronic learning more so than we even know. Thank hey, I oh, go ahead. I agree 100 percent. We have a committee in place, um, so we will go back. Um, Ms. House, Director of School Leadership, is facilitating that committee along with uh, Mr. Rozier. So we have that uh, suggestion down so we can further enhance what we offer at CDA and really take advantage of the skill set. We really leaned hard on the teachers at CDA when we first got into this pandemic because they were already doing this work. Um, so we will continue to work with that committee and expand um, and do some great innovative um, approaches to learning. So thank you. That would that would be good. I appreciate it. And it would make differences even money-wise, mm -hmm. class size-wise, and what have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bates, do I see your hand? Yeah, yes, you do. And I, I did. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good, good. So I did the virtual high school CDA graduation, and I learned that day that they went from a little over 300 students pre-pandemic to over 4,000 students. And I mean, that to me, if, if I had to nominate somebody for principal of the year, it would be Eric Rozier <laughs> for, for handling all of that. And, you know, no complaints. Their staff just forged ahead. And, I mean, they deserve an incredible amount of kudos. They are the experts. And the more we can support that school uh, to, to make it the finest online school in the country, I think we have the staff and the leadership in place to do it. So I, I, I support the recommendations as presented in the presentation. I think spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for a handful of students is not the best way to, you know, the best steward of our of our funds. And especially when, when we have all of this expertise at uh, CDA. So good presentation and, and incredible, incredible work this year by that school. Okay, thank you. I'm going to close this out by saying I, I agree with my colleagues in terms of your recommendation. Um, I, I also, I've been a proponent of CDA, even when we were going through back and forth about whether it was worth the while to get it up and running. And I've seen it grow. I've seen it prosper. I've seen students and, and families, as you stated, um, who, who uh, enjoy it, and, and also staff, because it was also a good option for some of the staff. So I don't know as much as I probably need to know about um, ingenuity, but, but I do think it has, we have a lot, of, a lot of room to improve. As Ms. Bolton said, looking, you know, even from this year and beyond, any way we can enhance CDA and boost it and uh, uh, do different things, I think it will be better for us. And so I fully support the recommendation around the concurrent learning as well. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, we did try, we did offer, that's what we can do. But I think in terms of um, maximizing the, the best benefit for our students and, and, uh, and families, I think this is a good recommendation. So thank you again for the presentation. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you back again soon. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so next presentation is the budget update. Treasurer Wagner. Good evening. Oh, before you get started, I just wanted to make this this point in saying you are doing a budget update. And I just wanted to say to the people uh, are here, our public, that 
if if they uh, they will have opportunity, they can also comment and give feedback around the budget presentation as well. I just wanted to make sure that they knew that. Sometimes I don't, you know, we don't hear a lot about the budget stuff, but I wanted <laughs> them to know that that's an opportunity for them as well. Absolutely, we welcome their feedback. Um, so I am honored tonight to bring to you the budget that supports the learning models that they just presented. So it's very exciting. Um, okay, so, so key points for tonight. We're talking about the general fund budget as it stands today. Um, a request for a temporary appropriation resolution to get us through the first 90 days. Because of the state revenue uncertainty, and we do have some news about that, um, we'll talk a little bit about the ESSER funds and then what our next steps are going to be in terms of um, public engagement and feedback. So just to remind the board and the public, um, you might get sick of seeing this pie chart, but this is the general fund revenues. Um, and what I want to point out is that the lion's share of our revenues of the general fund come from property taxes, which do not grow with enrollment. So for all these students that are coming returning to us or new students that grow, those dollars get spread thinner for every new student. It makes it very challenging to implement innovative strategies. <clears throat> and then the dark green pie is state revenue. And as you can see, it's a pretty large chunk of our revenues that are going to be changing. Um, we don't have a lot of details yet. So uh, under the state budget, it's not complete. It just went to conference committee today. Um, the Senate version of the bill, we would have lost about a million dollars from this year to next year, in addition to losing about five million of student wellness dollars. Um, it would have passed, removed all the pass-through funding for tuition for vouchers in, in community schools, and then we were very concerned about the impact to the preschool rating system. So, breaking news, at 3.41 this afternoon, we received a uh, news release that the, um, they adopted the House Fair Funding, the Cup Patterson, the one that we were in favor of. And so this is really excellent for us. Although what we don't, but it only applies to fiscal year 23, so not the budget that's coming up, but the budget after that. And we don't know what got traded yet in a, to make it happen. And so um, I'm sure a series of meetings will be held with all the treasurers. The urban treasurers are already communicating. And um, so we'll keep you updated with what the, what that, the impact that it's going to have on our budget. We still don't know yet. But <clears throat> they are talking about removing the pass-through funding, so that, that will be good for us. Um, other than that, I don't know what the simulation is going to look like yet. That will have an um, impact on the cliff, because if we, the fair funding model is going to bring us more money in the original simulation into future years, and so that will help us a lot. So what I wanted to do was review the packet you received on Friday, um, and so you know how it's going to play into this PowerPoint. And then so just for the public's information, everything that we gave to the board on Friday is going to be published on our website tomorrow. It's just they're, they're huge files, and it's hard to put on a slide because there's a lot of data. But so the first... Uh, item in your packet that was labeled number one is the general fund comparison of the fiscal year 22 proposed budget compared to the current year or the what year that we just ended with that budget and then some changes. The second um, handout was the combining the four major operational funds. So as we were moving forward and trying to support um, the strategic plan and our new normal based on COVID and all the changes and blended learning, we had to make sure that we were optimizing the major four operation, operational funds to maximize their use. And so I'm presenting to you for the first time ever a con that combined budget. The third handout is focusing on just the general fund and the school-wide pool and how, where we spend the money, school centrally or centrally allocated. And then, um, uh, handout number four is the budgeted staffing information where I'm showing you the current year rate of vacancies um, and why we create that negative um, contingency. And then um, the staffing changes, changes to support next year's plan, strategic and new shore. And then there's a, a draft of the ESTER plan, the three-year plan. Um, we, the uh, PLT is working on it all day tomorrow. I can already see there are some areas that need to be fixed. So with that, I'm going to pause and I'm invite 
Superintendent Amat to uh, talk about the funded initiatives. Thank you. What we have done here is separated out the strategic plan and the new shore. So this first slide is showing you the strategic plan in year three initiatives. So for Student Center, we are going to adopt a science curriculum and world language. We added six more instructional days for preschool. And um, also we're looking at a budget redesign for health and safety. Alternative learning centers, it says 10 initially. We were um, doing some PD for 10 more schools. Uh, we shifted and decided that all of our schools will have PD on restorative practices. Um, and that's coming out of our positive school culture um, department. We have added eight school social workers and 12 schools will go deeper in social and emotional learning with our QI work. Um, part of this budget redesign and COVID influence modification, we've added 26 more school social workers and 59.5 more nurses. So that has taken place um, to get us started from uh, COVID. For community engagement, we've added 11 resource coordinators and eight parent groups. Optimized capabilities, we wanted our schools, at least 25% of our schools and departments to engage in quality improvement projects. And then 45 schools in employee engagement. And for employee engagement, that is um, spreading the Gallup tool to get feedback and um, use that to help with staff engagement. Under growth, uh, we wanted to increase enrollment by 457 students and in preschool specifically 100 and then expand Pleasant Ridge, Hyde Park and Walnut. What was decided um, because of COVID was the expansion to do the Walnut Hills Dome. Um, so that's in place. Our next two slides are specific around the new shore. So our innovative programming that we would like to offer. We know that principals are the number two impact on student achievement. We are going to start investing in our principals and providing coaching and support. We talked about expanding African-American studies at all of our high schools, outdoor learning, Night school, we started that work this year in uh, the spring. And so we've learned from that and we want to scale that work. ELL students going to school beyond the typical school day. We've added American Sign Language, um, expanded our world languages. We've added a diversity officer. I'm really excited about the instrumental music program. Um, we did not have all fourth graders doing band. All fourth graders will have access to instrumental music. We have expanded our uh, first grade reading by adding reading specialists, our concurrent model, and life sciences. Under health and safety and community engagement, we've added the Meridian Plan, we are now um, doing an RFP for the customer relationship management tool. We've learned during this process that we have to tighten up our customer service. So this tool will help us have data quickly and that we can respond. Um, employee benefits, students and parent communication we want to invest in and employee engagement. Increase our Wi-Fi and device services. English language learners engagement, student recruitment, and COVID prevention with uh, supplies and materials. Treasurer Wagner will come up and talk about staffing. So what, what's on the screen is just a high level summary of um, additions to the staffing complement at CPS to implement 
um, all the strategies that we just talked about. So um, 100 and I can't even read this. 166 classroom teachers, you know, 13 supporting career tech, 12 ESL, eight and a half foreign language, um, math specialists, and reading specialists were restored, but then we added, as Tiani Amat said just a minute ago, the reading specialists, we've increased those. Um, and then 38 more classroom teachers, is that supported going back to a seven bell day and the returning to our higher level enrollment from pre pre previous year. And we also added 63 educational support personnel. Um, the majority of that is a, the increase in school social workers, um, paraprofessionals, school-based support, that um, elementary system principals or uh, librarians and counselors and occupational therapists. Um, and then centrally, um, we brought back seven of the positions that were cut from last year and then expanded um, to support some of those new offices. The, um, in your packet, you actually have specific line item details of the locations of all those changes, but it was just too much data to put on a slide. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Um, okay, so here's the new process of consolidating the budget. Um, and what I'm starting with this year is the four major funds. So general fund, OI pool, which are the title schools and their budgets. Um, the CARES Act money that we're using to help support the um, avoiding learning loss, continuity of operations, and, and health and safety and virus protection. Um, and then, of course, student wellness, because together that's what's supporting this major plan. You can see that the general fund represents 52% over half of that, um, and then 28% um, is CARES, and then 18 is OI pool. So you might ask, how are we spending this money? And so what this chart is showing you is that the blue section, 56% of that of those combined funds support uh, salaries and benefits. And then, um, glasses keep fogging up. Um, the pink portion are the purchase services. And so that because we're heavily outsourced, we outsourced our transportation services, tuition is part of this. So if they do pass through funding, this pie chart will change dramatically because about $86 million of intuition expense will disappear from our budget. This is the data that goes behind that pie chart for those that like to see numbers. Um, I'll just point out on the general fund, and this is high level um, cost allocation. So on the general fund, the next to the last line is the school wide pool transfer, $224 million. That's how the school-wide pool gets resourced. So in the general fund, we get revenues for property taxes and state revenue. School-wide pool gets their resources from the general fund and from Title I. And so the difference, it comes from Title I. Um, so the transfer happens in the general fund, the spend happens in the school-wide pool of $245 million. Diving a little bit deeper into the budget, this represents the purchase services slide, that big chunk that um, I talked about earlier. And so you can see the orange slide, it's the majority of it, that's tuition. So um, as I said before, 86 million will go away if this uh, funding plan goes into place this year. Transportation represents about $40 million. The next largest chunk is what's called other purchase services. Um, the contracts written in there are um, the payments that we made to United Way for the preschool expansion, $7 million. The ABC contract is in there for to support our athletics and extracurriculars. And then we have about um, $4.8 million in um, technology support contracts through our desktop management and network services. The little beige pie chart I wanted to point out is called property services. 10 million of that is our technology leases. So they act as operating leases and they, um, by state definition, come out of that little pie chart that also um, represents about a million dollars in repairs and maintenance. And I was thinking, as I was building this chart, I was thinking about, um, that's kind of an unfair representation of how much money we spend on repair and maintenance, a million out of a $676 million budget, but we have an entire maintenance fund 
in addition to all these funds that we support and spend, we funded 3.4 million every year, and that's what the facility department uses to maintain those beautiful buildings that we have. And so as we progress into our sophistication of, sophistication of our consolidated budgets, we're gonna start showing you other funds and how it collectively supports the enterprise. That makes sense, I hope. Okay, so now I'm digging a little bit deeper into supplies because that's kind of a misnomer as well because the textbook adoptions come out of the supply line. Um, and so you can see um, $6 million of electronic instructional materials, so things like Edgenuity, Schoology, just to name the two that they talked about today, um, is our instructional software. Textbooks, $5 million that supports the science and world language curriculum in addition to um, the CARES money that's in here. Just software materials of four million, that's all the stuff that we use software to run our business. So Power School for Students, the Financial Power School, Business Plus System, HR System, um, food service software, transportation software. Um, under computer supplies, that can be anywhere from network cables to servers, um, things that are purchased. And then the green, big green chart, office in general, all our health and custodial supplies fall under general. So that's a really large chunk of funds that are being spent. The majority of that um, is $14 million is spent on health supplies next year. So it's all the PPE um, items that we buy, the, cl the cleaning supplies, disinfectants. Um, okay, so now I'm focusing on just the general fund and the school-wide pool budget like you traditionally see. And so where is that money spent? What I'm showing you here is exactly 50% of those funds get spent at the school level, budgeted and spent at the school level. The light purple pie shows you money that's budgeted centrally, but actually they operate, those people operate in the schools. Um, like the technology team, the My Tomorrow Techs, um, transportation services, tuition, utilities, they pay for it centrally at a facilities budget, but it gets allocated out across the district. And it depends on the type of spend on how it gets allocated. Some spend is allocated by square footage. Some of it's allocated by student enrollment. Some of it is allocated by percent salary. And so it just kind of depends on the category, and those things are defined by the state. But there's a, a lot of money that we spend, um, that we budget centrally, but it's really spent at the school level. And then central administration is about 13% of that budget. And then the, the fixed um, slice is defined by our debt transfer and the fund maintenance transfer. Okay, so transitioning a little bit over to the pandemic funds that are helping to support this um, budget. SR2 and 3, as we stated before, is about preventing, preparing for, and responding to COVID. So it's reducing learning loss preventing uh, virus spread, and supporting the continuity of services, so things that were cut before or things that we have to do in order to operate and bring the students back into the classroom. As we met last time, I told you about two new requirements that, are, that come out of ESSER 3, the first being that we had to um, post, develop, and publish a plan, a return to school plan, and the deadline for that was June 24th. And I'm so pleased that we have such an excellent public affairs department because they helped us get it done on June 23rd, a day early. There's the link if you'd like to see it. So thank you, Krista, and your team. The second requirement for ESSER 3 is that we have to have meaningful consultation in the building of the plan and how we spend that. And what I highlighted for you on the left side, these are the rules. So every one of our stakeholder groups um, gets to participate. And then on the right side, I'm showing you what the engagement plan that we came up with. So starting so on July 19th, after PL does their thing, PLT does their thing, we're gonna present this three-year ESSER plan to you. Then we'll open it up with surveys, thought exchange and focus groups, get that feedback, bring it back to you again as we present the regular general fund budget. And, and I have to have it, the application to end by August 20th. So here's my favorite slide, the cliff. Um, so I think I said this before, but PLT is spending the entire day tomorrow together working on this, the three-year plan and the, and the cliff plan. 
and we'll be back. We'll bring it back to you on July 19th. So, what are our next steps? Um, we, we're, the next couple, we'll get public feedback today and from the board today, and then um, as we get more and more feedback as we come back, we'll come back on the 19th and present the Cliff Plan, the three-year ESSER plan, um, and then get some more feedback based on that presentation, and then do the surveys and the thought exchange. And then on August 8th, I'm sorry, August 9th, um, we'll bring back an entire budget presentation. And the, all these changes, so hopefully we'll know more about what the state's doing. And, um, and then ask for approval, the final appropriation on the 23rd. We have until the end of September, but I'd rather not wait because it makes it tough. It, it kicks off the whole next year slowly. So um, tonight, we're asking for a temporary appropriation 90-day plan. There's a resolution in your packet um, that'll help us get through this as we figure out what's happening with the state, how we're going to use our CARES funds, and how to um, keep moving forward. So with that, I'll entertain any questions. Board members, questions and comments? Ms. Bolton? Yeah, um, thank you. And thanks for all this very deep work. And thanks for actually starting to, in a concerted way share with the public the amount of money that really we are stewards for uh, there's often been a resistance that we only really emphasize the general fund uh, there's been an unwillingness to even share just how much money we fortunately have and we're always operating at a disadvantage by not sharing that and this is tremendous work I, I appreciate it throughout this uh, effort and maybe Mr. Hoyne might have to help us. Since we're interested in feedback, and we have this meeting tonight, we have another meeting in July, the July 19th. This budget is still evolving. And the CLIF plan is evolving. How will the board, board members, have an opportunity to continue to, to influence what you all are doing. How are we able, in our own protocol, when we send something to the superintendent, whether it's a request for information or a memo, our own protocol says that we um, have to CC our fellow members. Yeah, I, could, Madam President, could he come and explain? Because I'm very concerned as to how we continue to, to share because I know there are board members that may have the things they'd like to either add or cut or react to or put a priority star by it or something since we do have this time. And I think it is wonderful, as the treasurer mentioned, even tonight we already know more than we knew last week or about what kinds of monies there are. How, how would we continue to share views without doing something outside of the public purview. So all, all of the discussions and deliberations about the budget would have to occur in a public meeting. You can't have that outside of a public meeting. You could request information from the superintendent, and I understand your protocols are to ensure that kind of everybody gets to see what individual board members are doing. But to have a discussion or deliberation, you have to be together in a public meeting. Right, and that's, uh, don't believe, but a board member can have a memo that go to either the superintendent or the, or the treasurer. Is that possible as long as we go with the protocol, which is we must share but not ask for any, well, how's that communication work? We don't want to do anything illegal. I don't think, there's no prohibition against a kind of one-sided okay. um, uh, communication. I, I just think, you know, if, if then another board member writes in and says, responding to Ms. Bolton's, you know, that, that's where I think you'd be beyond what, what's contemplated. That'd be great. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we could continue to influence there if individual board members had individual thoughts or priorities to, to get to you. Could I, uh, could I have a Go ahead. You have can the floor. Thank you. Um, I, I have, uh, I remain sure that, again, CDA could be even more expanded. I, I also believe that we need to devote 
even more money to the high school level buildings, whether it's the career specialists or success centers. Uh, those are areas where I want to see more effort being made. There's lots of good stuff going out. PK-12, I'm, I'm excited about that, but I do think that the high schools may need some uh, additional help with the success centers and career specialists and any career funding. On the Meridian plan, um, we probably have to devote a little bit more time and money to that because to actually work through the Meridian plan, we're going to need to be able to announce certain aspects of it before the uh, uh, lottery and before the um, optioning. So I think that that's an area and maybe that's something, Madam President, we could have some board discussion about because it's in three or four different uh, stages. I, I still remain that we don't need A to E, A to S, and I know we cited the Ohio Revised Code, but I think Lighthouse starts to get in that direction. But I know you've redesigned A to E, A to S. I'm, I'm worried about the reduction to the ABC contract. Uh, the last thing I want to do now is cut any extracurriculars for our kids. And, and I think there's, I have things that I could propose to cut, but have we checked with the city? I know one of the things that uh, former Superintendent Mitchell left with us was three or four things. One of them was the Wi-Fi piece with the city. She had sent a letter. Yes. I know you're following up on all of that, but it might be something. The zoo school, are we set for it next year to be, this coming year, to be available to all of our high schools? Not just Hughes, because they talked about, uh, how shall I say it, dual enrollment or whatever else I think the career people have worked out. I know Mr. Uh, Messer was interested in the Cincinnati Green. And can we do more about merging that program with, with our own programs? And, and then the life science piece, creating that network. We have five high schools that do health careers, I think, or four, I'm not sure which it is, but even creating an internal network. I mean, there's lots of fantastic stuff here. Fantastic. Uh, it's, considering where we were a decade ago, five years ago, this is wonderful. But if we have some more ideas, and I know you're all thinking all day long tomorrow, if it's legal for any individual board member to submit some of their concerns. And I know that, that I know Carolyn will talk about it being a wish list, but I'm not looking at that. I mean, present cuts as well. So that would be great. I, I have many more things to say, but I can do it in another manner. Well, cut, if, you, if you're asking for cuts, that's a wish, right? You want that to happen uh, too? Yes. Okay. All right. Repurposing, cut, whatever you want to call okay. it. Okay. Expanding. Thank you. All right. Mr. Messer. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, first I just want to say thank you to the treasurer because um, I don't know that the, the general public gets just how complex this whole business is. Far more complex than I find it at corporate America in that you have things like today at 341, something comes in and completely upsets your assumptions, changes the dollars available, et cetera. And one thing I can say for sure is Jen Wagner is going to come as our treasurer fully prepared with the latest and greatest. So we thank you, Jen, and your entire team for keeping this going forward. <clears throat> um, and I am all for um, folks giving um, additional input in that type of thing. But I almost feel like we need to set us time aside. I hate to say call another meeting, but we got to get that done because I did think that we had done that um, at a couple of those budget meetings. And you know, I think it just if we just keep sharpening and sharpening and sharpening the pencil, it's going to get down to the eraser, and we're not going to have anything else to write with. So I think we got to let people have their say, but I think we need to call the ball so people can get to work in doing these things because, you know, the one thing I know for sure is people at my work are waiting for that budget to start their contracts with the new vendors and, and start building facilities, et cetera. I can't assume that uh, our people are any different at CPS wanting to get things moving. So I'm all in favor of let's get get the input in and then 
you know, try to call that as quickly as possible so we can get moving forward. Other questions, comments? Mr. Lindy. Um, thanks, President Jones. I think um, I, I shared some of this uh, at the committee of the whole meeting we had, but I wanted to just say it in the larger meeting and just check that it was still still true. But um, for my part, uh, I think this is really very strong, and a lot of it that's very exciting. Um, and my reason for saying that, and I want to just check that all these assumptions I have are still right, um, that we have a, um, this this is truly a once in a generation challenge and a once in a generation source of money, uh, and that our biggest priority is on student academic learning. It's a big deal that only 24% of kids in CPS can read and do math on grade level, according to MAP scores, maybe even as low as 17%. Um, but we're not satisfied with that, and we're trying to do something about it. Uh, and that we have attached to this enormous sum of money some very clear measurable outcomes um, that we looked at last time that we're going to use to hold ourselves accountable to doing right by kids and doing right by taxpayers. Uh, and that there's a, a clear strategy for what's going to move those numbers I think on the academic side, the big bet is this investment in reading and math specialists uh, and this idea of these, you know, every two week assessments. And I think that sounds like a very good plan. Uh, and that we have um, a, like a monitoring system for, for checking whether or not these investments are having the impact in the world with kids that we want them to have. Um, and so I think the, the first thing I wanted to ask is just, is all that still right? <laughs> uh, because if it is, I, I, I do think this is really exciting. Uh, and then I think um, preview of, of great things to come. It absolutely is still, and in fact, the feds agree with you because they're making a requirement that at least 20% of the funds go to learning loss to support or to fight learning loss. So yes, it's we are we are against learning loss here, right? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, great. So I think that that's all. Just you know, thank you to the interim superintendent and to the treasurer and your teams for all the hard work on that. Um, I think I uh, I had one th one thing I wanted to share, and then a couple of questions. Um, the thing I wanted to share is just given the, the, the stakes involved in all of it, I do think in the fall it's going to be really important for us to look at the numbers with some frequency to see what, what impact this is having. Uh, and I do want to make the, the case that we should, as a full board, at least once a month for the first couple months, uh, see what that looks like. Um, uh, the questions I wanted to ask, um, I'm going to read all four of them and you can uh, I don't, I don't think they take a, a ton of time, but um, I do think they're important. Uh, the first one is, you know, after this community engagement is done, um, how much of this can actually be changed, uh, or is it pretty much baked already? Um, I think that's an important question. Um, second, uh, I think I found where in the spreadsheet this number is, but I wanted to just ask Jen, how much do we think is unallocated of that ESSER funding for future years? Um, and then, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about um, if, if the big strategic bet is hiring these reading and math specialists, I think the time to find those people is like yesterday. Uh, and so I was a little worried about the 90-day extension in our ability to hire for those positions, but maybe that's a concern I shouldn't have I wanted to ask about. Um, and then my last one was just on the, on the budget spreadsheet, there was a, a $14 million line for concurrent learning. And I was trying to square that with a conversation we had earlier about not making the investment in concurrent learning. Um, and so those were the questions that I wanted to ask about. Thank you. Okay, so question number one. Whoops, I lost it. Um, after the communicate, how much has changed? We can change a lot of it. If we just have to comply with the rules. So it's not already baked. And that was the point is they didn't, they said they didn't want school districts to go in a dark room, create this plan, and then just roll it out. So we do want engagement. Um, the second question was, according to the three-year plan, I think your second question was about the CARES Act, right? So according to that three-year draft, there's about $20 million left at the end of the three years. But I can already see there's areas that are overstated. And also the facilities money that's in there, I have flagged to put into the American Jobs Act, think we get that money. So because that will support infrastructure. So we're still watching that. But so things are gonna ch they keep changing as they evolve. Um I forgot your third question. A uh, hiring timeline for reading and math specialists if we wait nine days. So the talent development HR department's been hiring already. Um that 
that was the challenge for me to come up with the 90 day evaluating value to support the contracts that needed to start on July 1 and to, to uh, support payroll for the first two months. So we're good. And then the, the 14 million oh, was the last one. Yeah, so the, th the one th comment you made about looking at the numbers monthly, were you talking about the measures or the, the finances? Or the both? academic measures. Yeah. Just the one about the concurrent learning was the last one. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, <laughs> that was a million dollar reduction, right? Yeah, yeah. Even if we reduce it by, I was interested in why we're going to spend 13 million dollars for something that no students are going to use. Yeah, I didn't know about it, so I didn't change the budget from there. But we will adjust it tomorrow. So no, we've labeled the entire bucket of a concurrent learning model under this, but it's really not. The initial, if you recall, the 10 point some million of it was around infrastructure updates and upgrades so that we had the ability to support like the engagement rooms and the ability to do more things with the infrastructure. These are things we would have done for the future of CPS anyway. Correct. They're all directly related to the future of CPS as well as then the additional two million there would be once we once we reduce the big concurrent, there were things that would have overlapped that we need to do now that we would have had in the normal budget but when we were doing the big concurrent plan, they were in there. So by removing that, we still have some of those things now we have to go back and do. Does that make sense? Mr. Morosky. Mine will be brief. Thank you uh, so much for the presentation, Ms. Wagner. Um, I'm exceptionally excited uh, to no one's surprise about the nurses and the school social workers. That is awesome news. and. Uh, just repeat it, 59.5 more nurses and 25 more school social workers, just in case any of the 136 people watching missed that. I think that's very significant. Actually, uh, it was 36 more school social workers. There was eight in the third year of the strategic plan, and then we added more. So it was 36 total. 36 total. Yeah, and then um, mm -hmm. the nursing contract went from a 2.4 million pre-COVID to almost 7 million. And yeah. so that what I wanted to do is reflect the number, of, because it's just a spend for us, mm -hmm. I wanted to reflect the number of nurses in from when, from pre-COVID to post-COVID. It's significant. Yes. It's very significant. And and related to that, my question, I, I think it's probably an easy one. In the, the massive packet we got, and I'm not, I can email, we can talk to like to Ms. Bolton's point, we can have these conversations other places. But the one thing I did want to ask that was related, on the counselor page, page 9 of 49, is this, are these counselors that didn't already, because not every school is listed. So I'm curious if this, these are all the counselors at all the schools or if these are just new counseling positions. Page 9 of 49. I'm sorry, page what? It's 9 of 49. I ripped mine out so I would be more, so it would okay. be easier for my brain, but I don't remember. I think it was in it was in the one with all the different school personnel, the biggest packet you gave us. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get to it. I have it. And uh, it was page 9. So there's 58 counselors in the district, according to this. So what you're seeing is um, the third column are the changes. Yeah. So you can see where they're allocated. So every high school has a, a number based on their enrollment, and then the K-8 chair counselors, because the 7th and 8th grades don't have the same access as high schoolers do. We, should, we made that change in um, the My Tomorrow initiative. But some of the elementary schools have them and others don't. Well, right. only K-8s have them. The K-8, to eight, only Because the it's the 7th and 8th graders, right. So not every school in the district would have so the, to Okay, that makes one. I got you. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, and then I'll, I'll just make a very short comment. Um, just kind of taking in all the comments from, from my colleagues, and um, I heard Ms. Fulton say, ask the question about how we influence the budget, and then she identified several areas. Um, and I, this, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but um, uh, most, I, I believe all of these areas that Ms. Bolton identified have been acknowledged by the board as 
part of our strategic priorities in some aspects. So there is funding allocated already for these things, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, the, when, when, when administration is looking at where cuts occur, how, how do we determine which programs get cut? How is that, how do we look at that? So the process that we used this year was that, I don't know if you remember the rubric that we put up there where it was the, the it, did this cost spend, this line item have the impact to student learning or operations or compliance? And that got scored. And so the lowest numbers are the ones we looked at to either shave back, so we okay. didn't cut it completely, but maybe we slowed down the implementation to it or delayed it for whatever reason. Um, and, um, and so that's how we made those kinds of decisions. Okay, so programs actually, if they underspend their dollars and they do it consistently, that's, to me, that would be a red flag to mm -hmm. say, you know, and, and I don't know what programs do that. I don't get into the, the I haven't gotten into the minutia of looking at that, that level of detail. But the other thing that I also, that I heard administration say is when you do this cliff thing, and I remember at our last meeting, I, the idea about waiting for this cliff to do this appropriations thing didn't sit well with me, but now I think I appreciate it a little better, mm -hmm. a little more. But um, when, when this cliff thing is doing, we are looking at over time where, how we're going to get the budget down over the next few years. Is yeah. that correct? Right. So everything that's okay. in the CARES budget, what are we going to do when that money goes away, when that grant ends? What happens is the general fund ends up taking over and then it just keeps continuing to grow because we don't really historically cut other things like the nursing contract. Are we really, do we really want to have that high level of nursing after we may all have that money's going away? Okay. You know, those kinds of things. So it could be that we say, okay, we no longer need this line item for the general fund. We can use that. But we, those are the things that we have to work through. Okay. Um, I, I was, I just wanted to ask those questions. I guess my closing remark about it is it's always hard to deal with budget issues. <laughs> Money is everybody's favorite topic to, you know, I mean, we, and it's our job to balance the budget. Correct. But, um, the, the level of detail that was in this report, I, I tried to read through it. I read through it. I tried to understand it and it's helpful to have you explain it. But, um, I really look to administration to give some recommendation and guidance about where we cut and how we prioritize things. Mm -hmm. I do think it's the board's overall, you know, we're accountable. So I do understand the need for us to want to impact that or whatever. And so I'm not going to even mention that word called wish list. I'm not, not, not in that context, not in that context, but um, I do want to say it is hard to have to raise concerns about where you cut. And um, so I just said all that to say, I, I depend on administration and appreciate the guidance and suggestions that you have. I look forward to seeing the CLIF plan because I think that will help a mm -hmm. lot in terms of where we are now compared to where we need to be several years from now. So that, that's all, that's so, all. So we've heard the, engagement with the board um, a couple times, even um, Mr. Messer said something about another meeting, and I did have a recommendation in one of the slides, I failed to mention, I apologize, but um, that we could, I could host a budget retreat between administration and the board to get into those kinds of conversations. It used to be the committee, the whole meetings were more um, dialogue-ish, more discussion than it was just presentations, and so we haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. Um, so if the, if it's the will of the board that would like to do that, have another meeting, I can certainly organize that. Okay. Yes. Ms. Bolton? Just uh, directing this to the, to the superintendent for the most part. The, you know, figuring out what COVID we don't have to do, figuring out what of the strategic plan maybe would have been over the top or not as much. I mean, all being informed on in those areas, I think is important. But the other thing, and I hope this doesn't sound too weird, but part of it is just as the treasurer mentioned, the president mentioned, is the speed at which we do things. The, the, and that's the, that's partly the cliff. Do we do things incrementally 
but do we do it particularly now when we're also previewing the new CPS? I mean, there is a public uh, awareness of how we're going to be spending our money now. And we have to, as much as we want to be careful and we want to do incremental things and go bit by bit, that we need to be doing things that are impactful as early as we can get them to be impactful for the public to understand what we're really trying to do here. I mean, it's just, there's, it's a, as Mr. Lindy mentioned, this is a once in a generation amount of money or, or more, you know, this is also one of those weird times when our, our public needs to have a sense that something huge is happening. If I can just add, um, those funds, uh, grant funds are really around COVID, correct? So it really helps us to understand the purpose of the money um, and its academic base. It's make sure that we have a safe environment. So we have um, a process that we look at uh, to, to, to determine that. We will go through that um, tomorrow. I really like the idea of a retreat. The more that we can have open, transparent conversations um, that we're all on the same page from administration and all board members, mm -hmm. I think um, it will have it will yield high results in making sure that we stay in line with the compliance part of these grants. Um, and then, what are our priorities? Okay. That's good. Any other comments? Any further comments? Thank you, Ms. Wagner, for a very thorough report. Yes, and Ms. Amat for, uh, and your team, thank you for the presentations. Okay, so we're going to move. So we're making a little, a slight adjustment in the agenda. Um, we, we have a special resolution that we want to do this evening, and this gentleman has been waiting so patiently. And he said, I'll wait as long as you need me to be. And that's just the kind of person he is. But um, we're going to actually do the one resolution now. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Messer and Ms. Bates, do you all have a copy of uh, the resolution for Mr. Yes. Robbins? Okay. I don't, oh, I don't in front of me. Okay. All right. I can send it over to her. Well, we you don't have to. We'll, we're, we'll, we will just move forward with that. Um, I thought it would be great if if uh, if board members could do round robin and just go through it. Everybody, just take a couple lines, and we will uh, do that. Miss Miss Bates, if you since you don't have it, we'll go ahead and and speak on your behalf. But I'd like Mr. Roberts to come up to the podium, please. Jerry, 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 Jerry. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna um, ask Ms. Bolton if you could introduce the, the uh, resolution. The title and the first couple lines, please. Recognizing Gerald Jerry Roberts for his many years of service to Cincinnati Public Schools. Whereas Jerry Roberts, proud association with Cincinnati Public Schools began as a student at Hoffman Elementary. He and his 10 siblings attended CPS until his family moved out of state. And whereas in June of 1985, Jerry began his decades long career with CPS as a substitute janitor and his singular work ethic was recognized and he was promoted to custodian two, then to power plant trainee, then to power plant helper. In those positions, he worked throughout the district at various schools until he was assigned to Western Hills High School in December of 1988. And, Mr. 
Whereas in June 1989, Jerry was promoted to plant operator one, signed to Kilgore, where he worked hard and earned his third class engineer certification, which enabled him to be promoted in November 1990 to plant operator five, assigned to Heinhold. And after a brief temporary assignment in the Energy Management Office in November 1993, he was promoted to plant operator six at Hayes Porter Elementary. And whereas in 1995, Jerry briefly left the district to work for the YMCA, but it wasn't the right fit for him. And he quickly returned to CPS. <laughs> so we don't count it. Scratch from the record. Quickly returned to CPS as the plant operator assigned to the Ed Center, where he gained the reputation, a reputation which continues to this day as someone who would get things done, solve problems, and never worried about job descriptions, and whereas while still working full-time at CPS, Jerry took the advice of a manager who encouraged him to pursue the exploding field of information technology. And after completing that education, Jerry was promoted to Voice and Telecommunications Administrator for Information Technology in September 2000. And whereas, as Voice and Telecommunications Administrator, Jerry began working on the $1.2 billion Facility Masters Plan, a complete rebuild of all CPS schools, where he assisted in the closures, transitions to and from swing spaces, and openings of countless schools over a decade. And... Whereas in August 2012, Jerry transferred to the facilities department as telecommunications manager and continued his work on the FMP, oversaw many facilities projects such as the district security systems and wiring infrastructure, as well as continued to manage the phone system. And whereas on November 1st, 2015, Jerry officially retired from CPS, but returned on December 1st, 2015, to continue his work as telecommunications manager, where his skills and knowledge of every square foot of CPS's 60 plus schools and facilities were still needed by the district. And whereas, oh, sorry, I'm, go ahead, Mr. Messer. Whereas for the last half of a CPS career, Jerry unofficially served as the frontline face of CPS for hundreds of vendors, contractors, technicians, and community members. And whereas during his 36 years with CPS, Jerry has served 10 superintendents and 18 school boards and personified I am CPS on a daily basis. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Cincinnati Board of Education expresses its deep appreciation to Gerald Jerry Roberts for his 36 years of service and his invaluable dedication to helping the students and staff of Cincinnati Public Schools. And be it finally resolved that the City of Cincinnati Board of Education congratulates Jerry on his outstanding career and wishes him the very best in all of his future endeavors. Cincinnati Board of Education. And I, Mr. Roberts, if you could come over here, Ms. Walton, you introduced the resolution, so are you, you uh, uh, introducing it for a motion, please? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the technical stuff. Yes. Um, yes. I would like to introduce a motion uh, for a resolution recognizing Jerry Roberts, for his many years of service to Cincinnati Public Schools, I so move and request a second. Is there a second? Second. second. I second. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Treasurer Wagner, please call the roll. Mrs. Bates. Aye. Bolton. Aye. Mr. Powers. Yes. Mr. Lindy. Yes. Mr. Messer. Yes. Mr. Morosky. Yes. President Jones. Yes. Congratulations, Jerry. I know it's COVID. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Jerry, for your years of service. Well, yes, he can say it. I have had a wonderful career. Yes. Oh.
Thank you, Derek. <laughs>
uh, to July. So really this is on here to get feedback from members about where they are. You will um, have seen if you if you piped in to our policy committee, we don't have the minutes today, which is fine, um, but a couple of things I think are significant from our policy committee, uh, not only for my colleagues, uh, but also for the public, uh, for those who were not able to attend our meeting. Um, it was assigned to the administration to ask our, our labor groups and parents. And uh, Ms. Bowers uh, um, her, was very people who actually have a space in our buildings who would ostensibly um, have to abide by this requirement, what they thought. And the, the results um, were somewhat varied, but there was, I think, kind of a theme that ran throughout. Uh, among the labor groups, it seemed there was not a lot of amenability to the requirement, but there was a lot of support for the vaccine itself just not perhaps a mandate per se. There was some discussion among some of the labor groups of perhaps offering a carrot versus stick sort of idea, i.e. extra sick days, you know, some sort of extra benefit to receive the vaccine. Uh, the parents, there were 7,000 people uh, that responded to a question of whether or not they would support this requirement for staff. Uh, they were split down the middle, about 40-40, with then the remainder sort of undecided. Mr. Lindy brought up a very, uh, I thought, important point of, you know, what was the breakdown of these parents? Who were these parents? Uh, were they a good representation of the district's families, or were they not? <clears throat> and then lastly, our co-located partners. Uh, I, I hesitate to use this word. It doesn't seem like the right word, uh, but... It, it's somewhat ambivalent. It was more of like, if, we're, if we have to do it, you know, we'll do what we have to do. There wasn't quite as much, uh, I think, a defined yes or no as there was with other groups. And so that's kind of the feedback from our, our, our community friends. Certainly you've read articles and seen news stories and gotten your own emails and, you know, texts or whatever, as have I, regarding opinions. And so um, I'll leave it out there. I'll pause now for discussion. Again, there is a resolution prepared on the agenda this evening if we are prepared to pass something like this or not. Um, as policy chair, uh, I'll say my two cents and uh, reference this briefly at our meeting last Thursday. I have tried to stay somewhat agnostic about this throughout the process. Today, I'm not as moved to do it. Um, just to put my opinion out there, I'm not as I'm not moved to pass it, but um, I'll leave it out there for President Jones. You can call on who okay. you want. Mr. Messer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, I think this is obviously a topic happening in a lot of places, and I just want to say I believe in choice. I think people have every right to choose if they want to be vaccinated or not. At the same time, choice should also have consequences. Um, what I know is uh, companies across this country are facing significant medical bills, especially um, self-funded organizations, because, you know, somebody getting the virus and being on a ventilator for a month or longer would be millions and millions of dollars. So if somebody decides, you know, they don't want to get a vaccine, I'm good with that. I would like them to sign that they will not charge to our insurance the costs associated with them being sick. And I think that's a very fair, like if, you know, you're going to take on the responsibility, um, you have to also take on the consequences. Um, the other thing too, as a parent, I would like to know if the person in front of my children every single day is vaccinated. And I think if they're not, somehow, some way, and I think this is an ask for the uh, legal counsel, but you know, with HIPAA, how can we manage um, a situation where people will be shocked if the person in front of them, like, what do you mean they didn't get vaccinated? I mean, my kids can't get vaccinated. Like, you're an adult, you can and you're not. And I think having a policy where if, if families are uncomfortable, I think we have to deal with that. And then should someone um, be unable to fulfill the role of uh, that they're hired for, 
we could potentially uh, uh, look to find them somewhere where they might be able to be unvaccinated and not have impact on children, or perhaps another uh, place of employment would be appropriate. So I'm all for choice and also ensuring that there are consequences, A, that we should notify families, and B, that the individuals would not hold the district uh, responsible for medical costs associated with a virus that could have been prevented had they got the vaccine. Thank you. Okay, other comments? Mr. Lindy? Uh, thanks, President Jones. I, I do have some comments, but I wanted to ask a question first, which was, do we have the follow-up um, numbers about the, the on the POSIP data, how that broke down by Title I or non-Title I? And uh, I, I appreciate that while folks are, are digging on that. I think um, what I wanted to share is, you know, I, I myself, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I have been vaccinated. I was joking that, um, you know, I turned 40 before my wife did. And so I was eligible before she was for the vaccine. So I got to sign up and take it before she did. That's been the, the, the first perk uh, I had of turning 40. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm glad that we have more than 70 percent of our staff vaccinated. That's above the local average that's above the um, state average all those things I think are good things the other thing that's true though is, is is people just seem genuinely divided on this I think that came through in the survey numbers um, I think it came through in some of the parents that I talked to um, I was talking to a, a, a clergy member who had, who had pointed out um, his wife works at UC Health and UC Health had not mandated vaccines yet for its staff um, but we're waiting until a later stage of, of kind of a permanent FDA approval for that um, and the response from uh, labor partners. Um, I think that, that um, for, from my perspective, um, it's not something I'd feel comfortable mandating at this point, um, though I think sometime very soon, uh, I think for my part, I could see that change. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bowers. I think Mr. Hoyne is gonna try to pull up um, what Assistant Superintendent Murphy sent. But I can go through it. So for Title I, 20, so 30% said yes, they would be supportive of mandatory vaccinations. 52% said no. 18% undecided. Non Title I. And we have, oh, I think it's popping up now. Non-Title One, we have 49% yes, supportive of mandatory vaccines for CPS staff. 37% no, 14% undecided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hoying, did you say? Oh, I think we got it. Thank you. Are you putting something on the screen? Okay. All right. Ms. Bowers. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Morowski, for us having this discussion in Board Matters. Um, I do agree with um, Board Member Master on choice. Uh, and my vocation, choice is everything. Um, I do not feel comfortable with a mandate on something that in, individually people can choose to do or not do. And I want to reiterate the, and I know that you said that you said co-located partners were ambivalent. i um, not real sure if um, we thought about their policies within their own agencies, and they are not mandated. A lot of them are not mandated, so that would be an undue burden for them with staffing and, and placing staff. Um, I, and I just, I just really think everything should be a choice. So I, I would not vote for that if, if we were voting today. Ms. Morosky. And I appreciate Ms. Bowers bringing that back up. And I, as I noted, I, I didn't feel that was the right word choice and I've had some time to think about. It. But when I say ambivalent, I think, and I don't want to philosophize about other people's responses, but it felt to me that it was kind of, their responses were born out of this idea that my, you're not really my employer. So like, I don't, what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to say? And that's what it felt. So ambivalent, I can't, but that's what it felt like with the response. It's like, well, I guess we'll do what we do. But yeah, their employers, to your point, 
my employer is a hospital and isn't requiring it yet. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Ultimately, to Ben's point, Mr. Lindy's point, when the emergency status is stripped, different conversations may occur because we'll ultimately probably have to have the conversation regarding children um, because I, we already mandate a lot of vaccines. I, I think we could go on and on with the conversation. It is, I, I appreciate that, that you expounded on it in board matters. It is on the agenda as a resolution. Um, the, the question is, do we want to leave it on and just take a vote or, do you, or are people wanting to remove it or what? Ms. Bolton. Uh, yes, I appreciate the, the comments. Uh, I would suggest we probably remove it, but I'd like to suggest something uh, in addition to the language, and maybe that means it goes back to policy in August. Something that one of our public, or actually one of our staff members said in our public part of the uh, policy meeting, is one of our social workers, if I recall. Um, one of the difficulties right now is that we, here we are uh, in the summer, School will be opening in a matter of a month or two, or a couple months, let's say. And some people are worried whether or not there's a job based upon how we vote on this. And that, that really hadn't occurred to me uh, as so as important. I didn't even think about that, that they're being worried. So from a standpoint of bringing back uh, guidance from the board, the guidance I would bring back to policy is there should be additional uh, emphasis on um, enticement to do so or encouragement to do so needs to be in this one. I think you have to eliminate the co um, kind of the partners. Although we told partners they couldn't come to our schools last, I mean, this past year, we couldn't have strangers. We couldn't even have people that we knew. So, I mean, I, I think there's a disconnect, but I don't think we can, they are not our employers, they are contractors or what have you. So I think you eliminate them. But the other piece is that I would give it a January 1 date, because I think some of the legal aspects of this would be there. And I'm surmising a lot of our COVID stuff is still gonna be with us as our practices in the first semester, once we heard from a couple of our experts in policy. So I would change the date, I'd get rid of the partner piece, and I would have more uh, about encouragement, and, but the encouragement cannot be you get more sick days. The last thing we want to do is reduce instruction uh, anywhere at any time. I don't even want people to travel or do PD if it takes them out of the classroom away from children this coming year. But those okay. are the changes I'd like to take back from this discussion back to policy. Yes, and and um, just in closing, I, I was actually going to suggest that things go back to policy as well for consideration. Um, I do. I just think in general, it's hard to enforce that policy. It, it's. It, I think it would be generally hard because it really does force people to make certain decisions about their belief system or whatever, and and, uh, and their job. But um, I think everything that folks have said tonight makes perfect sense to me. I think we all want everybody to be safe. And, you know, I don't believe the pandemic is over. And I think um, our safety precautions, I have um, a great deal of faith and confidence that we'll keep that up and do what we need to do. Um, and a lot of this, the action that we take on this policy, if we do decide to not deal with it, but I'm looking at the next topic for discussion, <laughs> requirements to wear masks. And I think there's a direct, it, there's a direct, um, it, in, yeah, regarding that piece. So uh, I'd, I'd be more apt not to approve the policy or support the policy. Last comment, Mr. Morosky. The only concern I have with putting it back to policy is actually, <clears throat> ironically, perhaps, was based on something you said as well regarding um, faculty. Uh, being unsure perhaps of what the status of their job might be based on this discussion. Um, I've made it no secret that I am concerned about morale. I know that everyone shares my opinion with that, but I think last year was traumatic for everybody for a multitude of reasons. I think a big part of it was the fact that things kept changing from where we sit 
I'm not saying it was anyone's fault or this or there, but that was just the facts and it was a trauma to everybody. And I feel like this is potentially adding another piece. And Mr. Lindy, I know in policy, had asked the question if we were causing unnecessary stress, and I don't I, with it, and I don't know if we are. I think it's a healthy discussion to have, but I, I do think that the longer this sits out there, the more uncertainty it is creating, and I do think it could have an effect in the classroom. I was the assistant principal of a school with terrible morale, and I got taken out on this, the kids, and I just I think that needs to be taken seriously um, with this. I think, again, it's a good discussion to have. I am personally, as I think everybody knows, a huge proponent of the vaccine in science, but I also wasn't elected to make personal decisions. Um, so I think I I'm in favor of keeping it on the agenda as policy chair. If it's the will of the board not to, then I, I won't. I can rescind it. We can rescind it and take it back. It's fine. I Furthermore, there's also, I, well, there's also the issue that the House, of course, has passed a bill saying it's illegal for us to do this. Now, Senate President Matt Huffman, who has a different political persuasion than me, just, uh, it, he, he, he seems want to not support this because he says you can't, you know, the government shouldn't tell employers what to do. But there could come a day, and Mr. Hoyne can attest to this, where we can't do this in the state of Ohio. Us. Could be either way. Okay, so, so I go ahead. If you, I just feel like it. I just feel like we're we we run the risk of continuing to leave uncertainty out after a year's worth of uncertainty, and I don't know that that's a, a good idea. Okay, so where we are now, because I heard you say something different. It is on the agenda. The question, and I'm hearing a general consensus that we may as well take it off the agenda because it's it's not going to pass. But if you want to go through the formalities of that, we can do that, um, certainly. But what we're saying now is for the most part, the, the board is not in favor of passing this. Now, whether or not it gets um, uh, revisited in policy committee, I think the discussion that you're referencing needs to occur in policy. And all these things coming down the pike or whatever it is, that we have to take a look at that. And I, I think we would be open to that. So I think that goes back to policy to re, to look at that and revisit it as as we need to. I don't want to disagree with my committee chair, uh, but I think it does go back to policy, just like the finances today. We know more today than we did three days ago, and, and, and so I just think that it doesn't have to be acted upon in August. It, it yes. can be tabled, but it needs to go back to policy. That's, yeah. And and so if we're if we're good with that, I think let's just move on. Let's take it off the agenda, and we can move on. Please. Give it back to policy. Okay. And then the next topic is is uh, policy fifty three twenty one requirement to wear masks, Mr. Morosky. So we had uh, talked about the requirement to wear masks and what that may or may not look like in the fall. Um, our experts, uh, Ms. Trimble Oliver and Assistant Superintendent Bunty, um, their guidance was that we continue to wear masks for the time being. And they're, of course, you know, here if anyone has any questions, I, I trust them. You know, the, it was kind of kicked around, hey, could we ease up some of this or could it be similar to, you know, when you go to a restaurant, it says, hey, if you have your vaccine, don't wear it, which, of course, is literally impossible to <laughs> to like track, right? Uh, and maybe in a restaurant, they don't care so much, but in our schools we do. And so um, Ms. Bolton had brought up something interesting regarding if the, which now it's off the table, but if the like, say for example, a vaccine policy was there, part of the carrot could be, if you do this, you don't have to wear it. Again, difficult to enforce, difficult to track. So just put it on board matters, get, People, if they wanted to talk about it, I thought we had some substantive stuff in policy that was uh, important for the full board. We all three thought it was important for everybody to have their two cents. But again, the guidance from our, our experts in the administration was we leave the mask policy as it is for now. And I just wanted to pass that on again in lieu of the minutes. I thought those were two important things to bring up today. Well, we, we don't have a resolution for that. So I think it'd be, that one would be an easy one to resolve. Uh, it makes perfect sense to me to follow our existing protocol for that. And I don't know, you know, again, you know, um, it, we got 70 percent vaccinated people. We're at a uh, the threshold. We, you know, I, 
what more can we do except mandate it? And then we don't want to do that. So I would just assume um, stay with our current safety protocols, as you're stating, if folks are good with that. Anybody else disagree, Ms. Bolton? I, I think if you've been fully vaccinated, you shouldn't be having to wear a mask. Because I think there's negatives to that as well. The enforcement piece is, of course, difficult. That's the issue. Yeah. And that, in part, is the issue. And I do think it's an incentive for people to get vaccinated to get rid of these masks. And I think I would like to have the administration be able to make uh, a, a, a report back, besides their own their advice, which I trust. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to see the real justification why the rest of the world is not doing it and we would be continuing to do it. So, I mean, that's just, I'd like, to, that might be an assignment. Just come yes. back and, and explain to us and the public yes. why we have to keep that, doing this. I think it's an appropriate assignment. Thank you. Okay. All right. So if we're ready, we're, we're at hearing of the public now. Okay. So we are now at the item on the agenda for hearing the public consistent with the state's direction to minimize public gatherings. We are convening this video conference call to include opportunity for public comment. Each speaker will have two minutes and will direct all comments to the presiding officer. Consistent with board's bylaws, the board has the ability to limit the hearing of public on any single issue and will exercise the right to do so if needed. Once a request to speak has been granted, you will be invited to enter. Please click on the camera icon to go interactive. Provide your name, your affiliation to the district, your school community, your topic, and your contact information if you want a direct response to any questions you might have. This request is consistent with the board, with board protocol and we appreciate your compliance. We reserve the right to not permit you to speak if you do not comply. Again, each speaker will have two minutes and may only speak once. Please refrain from discussing any personnel items. After speaking, you will briefly see the welcome screen again as you transition back to the live stream meeting. We ask that your public commentary be respectful of all those listening in. And again, you are certainly welcome to provide feedback or input or ask questions about the budget presentation that was provided earlier. How many speakers? About nine or 10 speakers. Okay. Our first speaker this evening is Elena Thompson, followed by Angela Vornberg, followed by Kendra Phelps. Go ahead, Ms. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, hi there, I'm Elena Thompson. I've spoken to you beforehand. Um, I'm an attorney at the ACLU of Ohio. Today, I want to remind this board that we're asking for broad, multifaceted discipline reform in this district. It's not just about getting SROs out of school, but that is one part of it. Um, we're asking three things, to expand restorative justice, to record and publish discipline data, and to remove police from schools. I understand that this district has a small restorative justice program in a few schools. That's great, that's a solid start. Um, to have it truly work, though, you need to have a concrete plan to implement it district-wide. We've seen it work in over a dozen major districts when they've made it a priority, specifically when they authorize regular trainings, when they designate spaces in each school for conferences, um, whenever they hire student support professionals, as you have done, um, and center the idea that behavior correction shouldn't be punitive but educational in nature. You know, we don't have to think about discipline as we have for the last 50 years, especially when it doesn't work. Uh, I know CPS allocated money towards more counselors and social workers, and that's great. These new hires would still place CPS far behind the recommended ratios for student services, although it is closer than it was previously. We'd like to see more counselors hired specifically. Um, you know, we put our money where our priorities lie, and we want to see CPS sending the message that watching our students succeed is more important than policing them. Um, between arrests, warrants, summonses, and referrals, this school district, in partnership with CPD, forces more than 400 students per year into former, formal interactions with the justice system that follow these children for the rest of their lives and irreparably harm them. It looks like a student spending their graduation day in jail or an 11-year-old in handcuffs instead of learning fifth grade math. But frankly, most of the time, it looks like a black boy charged with disorderly conduct, a charge that is so broad and so vague that it can encompass almost anything. 
that's not safety and that's not justice. So please change those policies. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angela Vornberg, followed by Kendra Phelps, followed by Beth Urso. Go ahead, Ms. Vornberg. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, you can hear me. Um, I did want to touch just a little bit on the vaccines. Um, I'm a mother of two kids at Taylor Park Elementary, and I did want to discuss the possible mandatory vaccines, and then I was listening that it could lead down to the kids. I did want to show that the NIH website still shows the vaccines are still under clinical trial until the end of 2022, 2023, and that these vaccines are actually a clear violation of all 10 Nuremberg, Nuremberg codes. So um, I will try to do this as fast as I can. You can cut me off when I hit my two minutes. Number one, voluntary consent is absolutely essential. There should be no intervention or element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, or any form of constraint or coercion. By definition of a vaccine, must provide immunity to the virus, protect re recipients from getting the virus, and reduce death, infection, circulation, and transmission of the virus. We are told this experimental jab does none of these, yet they still call it a vaccine. As far as dress, constraint, and coercion, it's everywhere. If you want your life back, get the vaccine. The protocol for the PCR test given by the WHO and the CDC was knowingly set at a level guaranteed 100% false positives and false negatives. So really, is there a pandemic or is it all about getting people to take the shot? Do the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results unprocurable by other methods. The most fruitful method would be a healthy immune system, which can be achieved through good health, natural supplements, such as vitamin D, C, and zinc. People are not being told this. In fact, the people who point this out are being vilified and silenced. Number three, the experiment should be designed and based on the results of animal experiments. Thank you. And, and I just want to comment just for the sake of our public, uh, in case you missed it, we just had a conversation where we agreed, the board agreed that we were not going to act on that vaccination policy. So uh, just, and that's just for your information. Here is Beth Ursum, followed by Alicia Rogers. I'm sorry, our next speaker is Kendra Phelps, then Beth Ursum, then Alicia Rogers. Go ahead, Ms. Phelps. Hello, board members. I was glad to hear that you are not in support of continuing the concurrent learning model this coming school year. I want to thank board member Messer for influencing the collection of feedback from teachers and principals who are closest to that work. Superintendent Amat pointed out the feedback overwhelmingly was against the con continuing the concurrent learning model. I just wanted to share that some of the concerns was that it was nearly impossible for teachers to meet the needs of the in-person students and the online students simultaneously. The concurrent learners were often left out and unable to access the hands-on and engaging lessons that teachers had prepared. Online students cannot clearly see the whiteboard and hear the classroom conversation. It's nearly impossible for a teacher to monitor student work and engagement of those in person and online. The OWL technology regularly had glitches. The um, model and technology is difficult for subs to navigate and concurrent learners often ended up missing class. I was um, a parent of a child who participated in concurrent learning and despite the teacher's best efforts, I can concur that the model was inadequate. Now that we are planning for student instruction, instead of reacting to a pandemic, let's do it with excellence. Again, thank you for your discussion and the fact that you are not going to continue the concurrent learning model. Okay, our next speaker is Beth Ursum, followed by Alicia Rogers. Go ahead, Ms. Ursum. I'm actually here with a question for the interim superintendent. 
And in particular, it's, a, it's about enrollment of CPS resident district students in, in the CPS schools. And in particular, the district uh, adopted a policy several years ago about allowing um, students outside the district to enroll in the schools, but to safeguard the priority for in-district students, an important part of that policy is if a school is at capacity at a grade level, the out-of-district students have to reapply, so the spots can be released for in-district students. I'm reaching out because over the past two months, I received several calls from parents in the district who were trying to enroll their students in Walnut Hills in the upper grades. In some cases, they had been there but had left for the year to get in-person mm -hmm. learning and were, were going back. They were told there, were no, there was no room for them and they were put on a waiting list. In the meantime, Walnut Hills had 250 out-of-district kids in the schools. And so by the policy, that should not have happened. So the good news is the parents reached out to board members and also um, to, to the treasurer. And so they were able to get admitted, but it's a sign that the, poli that the policy the school board adopted, they're not following it. So my question to the superintendent is, what steps are you taking to ensure you're in compliance with the school with the school board policy? Thank you. Our next speaker is Alicia Rogers, followed by CFT President Julie Self. Go ahead, Ms. Rogers. Just just so I, I just want to remind the audience that if you have a direct question, put your put your question in the chat box with your contact information. Awesome. Okay, and I'm going to do just that. Hello to the board. So grateful you all are here tonight and the patience you all have displayed during the pandemic has been beautiful and the hard work has been great and we appreciate you all as community members and we stand beside you in support of everything you all are doing. We are one together. Question tonight and feedback that I would like to ask for is regarding the ARP funding, the American Rescue Plan funding that's coming down. We wanted to know what was your plans for communications and community engagement would be, um, act, act, is it gonna be, are we gonna have access on how you plan on getting the information on where the money is going, when it will be spent, will parents have, will it be easily accessible for us and community members and other stakeholders to have access to that information? You all have done a wonderful job at being transparent, honest, inclusive when it comes to your strategic plan. And we know that it's a great big opportunity to have this money funneling down to us, but we wanted to know where is the community engagement portion of this? How will you inform us as stakeholders and community members will be prioritized? Will we have the chance to speak our mind and give our, give our feedback on where we think that money should be given to? Um, again, we think you all are doing a great job. We just want to know where where are we included as community members, students, and parents on that particular topic of the ARP funding. And I will put it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Bird, and then our last speaker will be Julie Sellers. Go ahead, Ms. Bird. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your service at all times, and especially the past school year, which tested all of us in new and various ways. Uh, the ARP funding is, as you guys mentioned, a once-in-a-lifetime influx of dollars that can make a huge difference to our schools, families, and communities. My question today is how will CPS consistently and publicly report on both the results of the ARP funding and how they will be spent. And by publicly, I mean in a manner that is accessible to the entire community. I'd like transparency in giving a decision-making timeline with consistent community engagement check-ins. Again, thank you for your service. And I'll put this question in the chat. Thank you. Our last speaker this evening is CFT President Julie Sellers. Go ahead, Ms. Sellers. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me yes. okay? Okay, yes. thank you. 
Um, I have a couple of things that I want to speak about this evening. The first one is I just want to thank all of the school board members for um, holding up on the implementation of the mandatory va um, mandatory vaccine and that this is really, I think, too early for any type of mandatory implementation. The other thing I would like to say is um, we have spent over 250 hours in negotiations, and I'm not sure that school board members really understand the extent of the number of hours that everybody has um, put in towards this process. Um, for the past few weeks, we've had a very positive experience, and I just want you to know that I think that there are so many positives that are coming from negotiations. I think that the board will be very happy and pleased as we begin to implement all of the changes um, that we have within um, the contract. So I just wanted to give you those two updates this evening, and thank you. Thank you. Is that That's all the speakers we have. Okay. Anybody have any kudos? Ms. Bowers. Yes, I have kudos for our CPS team and interim superintendent Amat on the block of parties. And I heard the um, radio announcement on the WIS yesterday highlighting your dance steps. And I'm looking to see. <laughs> they were really excited to, to, to acknowledge. I was like, I missed the dance steps. But um, kudos to, to, our, to our TPS team, um, uh, Interim Superintendent Ahmad. Um, I think that this is an exciting time, uh, energizing our community um, around um, what's going on in the district and just being present. So kudos to you. I agree. I was at the first one. So. <laughs> yes. Any, any other kudos? Okay. Well, um, Ms. Bates, I am going, on her behalf, I am going to acknowledge our retirements and bear with me because I do want to read their names for both certificated and uh, civil service. Um, we have Annette Castle, Brenda Crawford, Carol Prince, Carol Del Prince, Susan Donat, Mary Ham, Elizabeth Henderson, Ruby Holt, Gina Clisado, Lisa Shelley, Julie Stallworth, and Marianne White as certificated personnel retiring. And then for civil service, we have Loma Angelo, Renita Barnett, James Fletcher, Patty Holmes, M. Charlene Jordan, Josephine Miser, Lois Moore, Spring Perry, and Jackie Williams. And I want to say congratulations to all of those people and thank you for your services to Cincinnati Public Schools. Wonderful. Okay, so we're at the item on the agenda for resolutions. Um, Mr. Messer, do you have the first resolution, the, the interim contract? We, you have to unmute. Please, please present the first resolution. Do you have the resolution on the interim contract? There we are. Yes, I have it. Okay. My, the microphone on me. Uh, Madam President, I present a resolution to approve the contract of the interim superintendent, Tiana Amat. I present the resolution and hope for approval. Is there a second? Any discussion? Ms. Wagner. Mrs. Bates? Aye. Fulton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Master? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Bolton, please present the resolution. Yes, I have a resolution uh, uh, to the Treasurer and Finance Committee to the board, a resolution to amend the transfer of funds to school-wide pooling fund from the general fund, Title I, Title IIA, for fiscal year 2021. I submit and hope for approval. 
Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Wagner. Mrs. Bates? Aye. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Mr. Messer, you're next. Yes, Madam President, I pre present a resolution for fiscal year 2021, 2020 through 2021 final annual appropriations. I present the resolutions as written. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call roll. Mrs. Bates? Mrs. Bates? Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Ms. Bolton? Yes, I have a resolution again from the Treasurer and from the Finance Committee for the Board. This uh, resolution, fiscal year 2021-2022, temporary appropriations resolution. Uh, I submit and hope for approval, and I want to thank the uh, Treasurer for all of her work to get us to this point and to be able to continue to have the work can, uh, proceed through August. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Wagner? Mrs. Bates? Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? <clears throat> yes. Um, Mr. Lindy, can I get you to present that the one since we see? Ms. Bates, are you there? Our As computer. I came back, oh, I'm delicious. a person. Okay. Okay, so I have number five, right? Yes. I have a resolution. Resolution to transfer funds to the school-wide pooling fund from the general fund and Title I fund for fiscal year 2021-2022. Uh, I present this resolution for, for adoption as printed. Is there a second? second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call roll. Mrs. Bates? Aye. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Mr. Lindy? We are on number six, President Jones? We are num on number um, seven. I have a different order on my sheet here. Yeah. Is this 6320? This is uh, yeah. the, the 1530. The principal one. Administrator. Evaluation administrator. Probably because you didn't have the first one on your sheet. Got it. It was an addition. Okay. So this is a resolution amending board policy 1530 for yeah. the evaluation of, of uh, administrators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ha happy to present that for adoption as written. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second. second. Thank you. Any discussion? Real quick. Discussion. Just real quick. Um, just uh, so again, since you know the, the the policy minutes, just so everyone knows, this is making the policy in line with OPEZ 2.0 Ohio Principal Evaluation Survey um, to complement OTES Ohio Teacher Evaluation Survey. Too. So that's what this is. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, Ms. Wagner. Mrs. Bates. Aye. Ms. Bolton. Aye. Mrs. Bowers. Yes. Mr. Lindy. Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Mr. Morosky, you have the next one. I am, I requested that Mr. Lindy present um, this one, uh, and uh, it didn't get changed in the agenda, which is fine. But Mr. Lindy, could you please present 6320? Sure. This is uh, a resolution amending board policy 6320 for the purchasing of goods and services. Uh, I present this as admitted uh, uh, and might um, offer something in the discussion section. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Lindy. So I wanted to thank, I think, my uh, 
colleagues on the policy committee, uh, our chair, Mr. Morosky, and Ms. Bolden for working on this for several months. I think this policy is, is a really good thing for two reasons. First, I think it consolidates a whole series of uh, things that relate to purchasing. We're scattered across different policies, but I think it makes this easier to use. Uh, second, I, I think we have an enormous responsibility to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and to align our spending with our values. You saw earlier tonight that each year we're spending more than $650 million, and to do that responsibly, I think, is really important. So this policy requires some disclosures from vendors proposing to do business with CPS. Uh, many of these we've already required in the past. Uh, to look to support minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, locally-owned businesses. Uh, it adds some requirements to learn whether or not vendors have things like apprenticeship programs, health care plans, retirement plans for their employees, uh, because we do want to support businesses that create real career paths for our students. So grateful for my colleagues' work on this policy uh, and hope it will pass. Mr. Morosky? If I may, um, yeah, I, I do just want to echo what Mr. Lindy said and, uh, you know, give kudos where kudos is you. Mr. Lindy uh, really pushed on this issue in our committee for the past six months or so. And you'll see in the next resolution presented by Ms. Bolton how many duplicative policies are being rescinded because of this and the hard work Mr. Hoying and Ms. Scott did in the general counsel's office. Um, and, you know, this policy, if you read through it, if you take the time to read through it, um, and this is for anybody who's watching, I think you'll be most impressed. Uh, we got pretty into it. Miss Bolton made sure that we left room for equity in smaller, more locally owned, black owned businesses who may not be able to abide, you know, by certain requirements a responsible bidder while also paying, you know, due to our, our, our labor friends and apprenticeship programs. It was not easy to do, um, and I know it's been a long meeting, but I felt the need to say this, and I did want to thank Mr. Lindy again um, for sort of pushing on this issue, because this is something that without somebody pushing on it, it could have just, we could have just ended up with these five duplicative policies we're about to rescind forever. And so kudos, Ben, um, and uh, General Counsel's Office, um, Ms. Bolton, and everyone who worked on it. I think it's really good. Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. This oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Ms. Bolton? Just as the, now as the policy, when it passes and it goes to the administration for the administrative guidelines, the, the hope is that there will be a sense of this is critical, as Mr. Morosky pointed out, to the equity piece, as we all, some of us live through the FMP and how the institutional kinds of processes were in place that prevented smaller uh, uh, contractors and vendors to be able to compete. So I appreciate the language that general counsel put in and, and I certainly appreciate my two colleagues on policy, but keep that in mind as you all now take over and do the guidelines, that that be part of the theme. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wagner? Mrs. Bates? Aye. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Ms. Bolton, the last resolution. Please. Happy to introduce the last one, uh, and always happy to rescind policies uh, and get rid of duplication since we do have 350 policies, way too many, I'm sure. Uh, resolution rescinding board policy 6320, business policy 6320.01, determination of the lowest responsible bidder 6320.2. Uh, business policy 6320.03, local business enterprise initiative 6450, equal and fair opportunity in contract employment and business opportunities. I submit and gleefully, gleefully ask for a second. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> no. <laughs> None needed. <laughs> Ms. Wagner, please call a roll. Mrs. Bates? Aye. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Or Mrs. Yes. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Thank you. We made it through the resolutions. Okay. Um, Superintendent Amat, do you have a report?
Today, I will be presenting on the 30, 60, 90 day plan. And I want to start off by talking about bringing back joy into our classrooms and workplace. It's a feeling of pleasure and happiness. And in order to get to the academics and social emotional needs of our students, we have to have a clear focus. And our focus is about the kids. And that will bring us complete joy and that you will see that embedded in the 30, 60, 90 day plan. I want to remind everyone about the strategy refresh. It is also included in the 30, 60, 90 day plan. As a quick reminder, we have student centered decision making, so learning anytime, any place, expanding course offerings is just an, another example for our health and safety to elevate our social emotional supports. Um, in our growth, recruiting our students back to CPS. We are the district of destination. For optimized capability, we want to build the capacity for the science of improvement is one example. Um, and in community engage engagement, we want to make sure our communities feel heard and valued. Also through the 30, 60, 90 day plan, next slide please. It's really looking through the lens of equity and anti-racism. We want to make sure we remove barriers so students have a barrier-free learning environment. We want to eliminate outcomes that perpetuate racism and embrace racial diversity. So the purpose of the plan, there's three key areas. One around fostering a district-wide climate that focus on student achievement for all students. Second is to cultivate public trust and staff relationships through clear communication and collaboration. And lastly, uh, to continue positive relations between the board and the interim superintendent. And I would like to say an email was sent out to our families, staff, community, partners um, regarding this 30, 60, 90 day plan. I have been in place for 30 days um, and learned a lot in the, in the 30 days. So I'm just going to briefly go over some of these items. One, starting with working with Su uh, Susan Bunty around assessing our social emotional plan for students when they return. The recruitment plan. One of the um, activities we had was the summer block party. So in front of you, you now have your t-shirts. We invite you to come out to the block party, have a great time. We also have behind you uh, yard signs um, to let people know we are enrolling uh, students and um, that's taking place at the block party. And we are open in July for enrollment. So you can come down to Burnett Avenue and have your child enroll. I had the wonderful opportunity to get into classroom all the month of June to see summer scholars take place and get feedback from students, um, parents, and staff members. Kudos to our team for putting such a fantastic opportunity together for our kids. So as you see through here on this first plan around educate all students, um, we put some things in place. We are starting um, in July in, in next week, and we want to make sure that we continue to walk through classrooms. I will be walking through classrooms, so establishing a calendar and being very intentional with my day. I want to be where the magic happens, and that is in the schools. We want to create a platform where teachers and principals have a voice. So using um, our principal leads to engage in, with PLT members, curriculum councils, department meetings. We are also, uh, Dr. Brown is looking at our professional development plan that supports and coaches teachers and principals. And then um, our new diversity inclusion man manager is starting July 1st. So I will be meeting with Super Assistant Superintendent uh, Murphy along with the new manager. So we can um, have specific goals um, to start this work. In August, 
we start to kind of get in some of the uh, state data, we will disaggregate that data and try to put action plans in place to eliminate disparities amongst student population groups. I want to highlight again, which will be very important, is to have those temperature checks to know where our students are in real time, and we can adjust our instructional methods to meet those individual needs. I will continue to have uh, walkthroughs, um, an idea that I've shared with uh, PLT members. I would love for them to do walkthroughs with me, so I'm going to use Sarah Trimble Oliver as an example. Her work impacts student learning. So when we go through the walkthrough, let's look at transportation, the arrival and the dismissal. Let's look how uh, kids are receiving their meals through um, the day during lunch and breakfast and how all of that matters. Our operational systems matters when it comes to academics as well. And we're gonna have a clear focus on every child can read. For collaborate and communicate, um, I started to have meetings with the superintendent, the former superintendent before she left, um, and started to have stakeholder meetings. So the transition was very smooth in making sure that those partnerships are still strong. I have scheduled meetings uh, with the chief of police and uh, the health department. I've already met with the fire chief. We are also looking at um, schedule meetings with all of our unions. That is already on the calendar for the year. For August, for collaborate and communicate, we will continue to have our community blitz. Um, I'm sitting on four um, boards, which include CYC, the Art Museum, Junior Achievement, and Families and Children's First. Um, so I have started sitting on those meetings and um, really has a great impact on our work here. I am working with Assistant Superintendent Murphy on doing a Parent Face Live, Facebook Live event. Um, we have started that with great success, so would like to continue that work. We will continue to also um, participate in, uh, or I will participate in the quarterly LSDMC meetings. So I have that scheduled uh, coming up. Also under collaborate and communicate, we are looking at redesigning our web website. We have already put a directory on there with emails and telephone numbers so people can contact us. It's under, um, I believe, about the district, and there's a link that says administration and has all of our wonderful PLT members. And if you go further down on the page, it also have our directors and managers with their titles and how we can be assistance to the community. We also want to um, improve communication. That was very clear that we had some, some gaps. So some of the things that you will see uh, that will be coming up along with the um, improved website, we will be doing a mailer quarterly uh, that will give information about tips to parents, uh, superintendent message, stories, telling our own stories about the wonderful things that are taking place, calendar events, and it is forward thinking. So not right on time, it's what to expect in the upcoming months so our parents are prepared. For board relations, it's starting to have uh, meetings one-on-one -on -one with board members. Uh, presenting, I did my first presentation with our team for the Committee of the Whole. Participating in uh, board committee meetings. And then lastly, for August, what will be coming up is the state of the district address to community and staff members and onboarding of our new staff. This is, in summary, this is a living document. So as I learn, things will adjust in this 30, 60, 90 day plan 
although this says superintendent 30, 60, 90 day plan, I definitely want to give a shout out to the PLT members. Um, they have been very supportive in the transition of this work. Um, they are very clear on each item and have went to their departments to show where they are in this plan and how they can support the movement to one, close the gap with the, the learning loss, two, um, to provide supports to not only our students and staff, but three, bringing joy back to the classroom and workplace. So that concludes my superintendent report along with the written report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ahmad. Um, I need a motion to approve the revised recommendations of the superintendent. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Morosky? I just want to say how excited I am to see this and the focus on joy and equity and anti-racism. Uh, it just makes me so happy. And even though you've been our fearless leader for some time now. I thought it was really exciting that you got to pass the resolution tonight. So I'm um, happy to do this work and we're just gonna keep rocking into the fall. So thank you so much. Thank you. Any other, any further discussion? Okay. Oh, I didn't see your hand, I'm sorry. Go ahead. About the what? Conduct. So that's, uh, I just wanted to be able to say that in the discussion. Recommendation the number five. Where where are you, Eve? Top uh, front page, and I need to oppose it because I, I know some good work has been done on revamping um, A to E to A to S to the Promise Center, but I still have great reservations about having um, anything that even remotely resembles A to E, A to S, especially as it includes grades four through 12. Find that difficult. And then procedurally, this is the second year that the Code of Conduct has not gone through a particular committee for discussion at length. It's, it's uh, it, last year, I think it was student achievement. It didn't kind of got there at the end while things are being done and uh, it's hard for the board to abide by the law and deliberate and do things in public for the sake of the public if, it, if we can't use our committees in particular ways. So just wanted to state my concern okay. about number five. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All right, Ms. Wagner. Mrs. Bates. Aye. Ms. Bolton. Uh, I accept for recommendation five. Mrs. Bowers? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Messer? We lose you, Mr. Messer? Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the report of the treasurer? So moved. The revised report? So moved. moved. Ms. Bolton, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Ms. Wagner. Mrs. Bates. Aye. Ms. Bolton. Aye. Mrs. Bowers. Yes. Mr. Lindy. Yes. Mr. Messer. Mr. Morosky. Yes. President Jones. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, this uh, return to in-person meetings it will be very short. Um, I, I just wanted to be clear and get direction around the will of the board. Uh, of course, the waiver is done after this is our last meeting. So we more than likely will be back in the ILC for open meetings. Um, I don't know if there are any specific guidelines or rules and I'm kind of looking at Ms. Trimble Oliver about capacity and, and all of that. So we need to take a look at that. Um, in preparation for the meeting on July 19th. Um, my question to the board is um, whether or not we even need to have an option for virtual. And, and from my perspective, it's gonna be extremely difficult to manage um, hearing of the public, 
physically and virtually. And, and so I don't know if board members have any ideas or suggestions around that. Um, you know, um, your, your thoughts, your comments are appreciated around that. Go ahead, Ms. Bolton. I, ideally, it would be great to do both virtual and in person, but we also just said that we really think it's ineffective and it's too hard to do uh, instructionally, because that really is what we would be talking about. We'd be talking about concurrent instruction or concurrent meeting if you're going to do both virtual and in person. It would seem difficult. I think it's great to try, but uh, I think it's difficult. And I'm more worried about distancing and the uh, in-person, at least these first few months, as we go back to it. Well, I don't know that I, I, I mean, I hear your comment. I appreciate that, but I don't know if it gives me any further guidance as to what the board wants to do. If we're going to try it, then let's try it. We just have to figure it out if we're going to do both. I, I, I hear your point, but um, I don't know. So it, it might be something, Jeremy, we might look for you to help provide us some guidance on that. Okay. Anything else um, regarding the in-person piece? Yes. Go ahead. Can we have the make sure the general counsel tells us about this is true for committees as well this this is regarding committees as well yes and what's the and is in in the olden days <laughs> um for committee meetings or even occasionally for board meetings you could phone into a meeting but it couldn't count as a Hope. quorum and you couldn't vote is that it? So, okay. Can you come up to the mic for us, please? Since we're still live. That that's correct. You, <laughs> you you may participate by telephone, but it would not count for a quorum, and you cannot vote. Uh, same, so, same for committee meetings, and same for regular. Okay. What about the public? Public um, participation and engagement and all that? Public participation is entirely uh, a decision of the board. The Open Meetings Act doesn't apply to it um, at all. For committee or for board meetings. So committees would have to decide on their own how they... So, yeah. for example, committees right now, our spaces are not big enough to accommodate, I mean, right? Am I right about that? To accommodate an audience. Go ahead, Mr. Ross. Well, that was going to be my comment or question is obviously we're not going to meet in the, the boardroom, but I know health and safety has been meeting in over in the Launch Ed building. Um, and, you know, I met, you know, policy, we're going to be meeting in person. I would suggest we meet in here or in room 1A or something like that. I mean, we're going to We'll be able to make it happen. I'll add my two cents about the, the participation. I I but, like the access that this stuff provides, assuming we can still do it. <clears throat> but I think a lot more people can participate in our meetings. But we need to welcome people back into the Ed Center. I now believe. now that I think about it, I think we did have a conversation about potentially using the banquet room because it was a little bigger That's in right. case people came. So that right. might be an option for yeah. committee meetings as well. I think that's I think that's smart. Okay. Yes, Ms. Bowers. Sorry, we would have to meet in person, but we could still stream the meeting. Uh, yeah, like so committee meetings. I'm refer referencing committee meetings because I think it you know includes more people that way. We can still invite them in in the banquet room, but I mean, we can still stream it too. Is that the objective? You can would, still would stream your meetings, yes. Okay. okay. All right. Um, okay, thank you. All right, so that, that I mean, that's pretty much all. I, I just wanted some clarity on that, but um, I think it's still going to be challenging, especially if we get a hot topic. We're going to have 50 people wanting to speak in the audience and 50 on the virtual. So we'll see how that goes. 
<laughs> we'll start doing, you know, we go back to our standard protocol, which is we start grouping people according to the topic and we narrow it down. Remember, whatever it is, five people per topic or something like that, we may have to do that. Okay. Well, we do have a sign up period. Absolutely. Yes. Any assignments? Ms. Bolton. Any other assignments? Wonderful. Having no other business before us, I declare the meeting adjourned.